Every good morning to everyone, to participants, experts, and organizers. Today we have come to the last day of a one-week short-term course program on recent advance of 3D printing and its biomedical engineering applications. We're going to start with the first speaker of this session, Professor Palak Mohan Pandey. Professor Mohan Pandey worked as a professor in mechanical engineering department at India Institute of Technology, Delhi, since January 2017 till date. As associate professor from December 2010 to January 2017 at the Department of Mechanical Engineering, IIT Delhi, and assistant professor at Department of Mechanical Engineering, IIT Delhi. Also worked as a senior lecturer in the Department of Mechanical Engineering, HBTI, Kanpur. His areas of interest are addictive manufacturing, 3D printing, and tooling, CAD, CAM, non-traditional machining and finishing, FEA of manufacturing processes, and biomedical applications of 3D printing. He completed his PhD in 2003 from the Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur, MTech in 1995 from Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur, and BTech in 1993 from HBTI, Kanpur. Now I would like to welcome Professor Pandey to the platform to present his speech on the topic Process for Preparing a Porous Biodegradable Metal Scaffold. Welcome. Yeah, am I audible now? Yes, sir. sir. You are audible, sir. Yeah. 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 Okay, so very good morning. Uh, and th um, thank you to Mr. Hirak, uh, who was in touch with me for this talk. And also, I'm thankful to the organizers of Royal Global University uh, for this invitation to talk with all of you on my recent research interest that is in the area of biomedical implants. So though the topic is little restricted and time is also only 45 minutes, I have to finish at 1045. So what I have decided, like it's not only uh, I will talk about uh, those things, rather I will try to give you a glimpse of few more things. And then I will come to the exact topic. Uh, which we have done at IT Daily in the recent uh, last two, three years, very recent work which we have done at IT Daily uh, because we have uh, developed some uh, met biodegradable metallic materials, uh, alloys, I'll say, and also the scaffolds, basically the porous scaffolds uh, by our own uh, uh, I'll say indigenous processes which were developed at IT daily. So two in two slides, I'll try to summarize those things. And uh, I will also try uh, that I should impart you some knowledge, which is a domain knowledge actually we can say, which is quite latest in the field. And uh, because I was uh, looking to the various speakers, uh, list of the various speakers, and I could realize that uh, you, the the nowadays, like uh, there has been many attempts when people are making uh, implants using metal additive manufacturing, and mostly it is the selective laser melting process. People are making, say, titanium medical grade alloy uh, AM implants, and they are being actually implanted. Uh, at various hospitals to the to various people. So just just hold on for a while. Uh, these these various uh, various implants uh, which are which are still uh, right now in practice. So definitely those those things have already been spoken a lot. Uh, I think there were many speakers. So my idea is that I will try to give a different kind of flavor and then uh, I'll try to tell you the various processes, which two, three processes, which we have developed at IT Daily, along with the material which we have developed uh, with this. So uh, let me share my slide. And uh, 
Okay, so uh, I have not yet used screen one, I don't know. It's called screen one. Okay, so I think uh, my screen is now visible to you. Uh, okay. Yes, so can you see this uh, slide now, Industry 4.0? Yes, sir, we can see it. The fourth industry. Okay. Is it okay with everybody? Okay, so, so let me talk about uh, these things. Okay, so, uh, so what is... Was it, what is smart manufacturing? Nowadays, you may be listening about smart manufacturing. Definitely, I'll not deviate to your topic. I will come back to your topic and you'll really realize the business potential of what you are learning for so many days. Anyway, so let's talk about the the, the annotation request. Annotation, the shared content. Everybody's requesting to annotate the shared content. Okay, so this is something uh, called smart manufacturing nowadays. So let me talk about, so what is industry 4.0? Like uh, from this slide, you can understand that I have tried to describe the four stages of industrial revolution. So uh, the, the first stage of industrial revolution uh, was the mechanization. What do we mean by mechanization? Mechanization is like when there was an attempt to, to eliminate or to minimize the human muscular effort or, or cattle's muscular effort. Like if you go back and try to see this time, earlier uh, the entire machines or maybe the whatsoever primitive machines were there, they were, they were driven by the human muscular power or by the cattle power. So the, the invention of steam engine, water or steam power, that has brought the first industrial revolution. And the first industrial revolution also became possible because of the steel production. That was, here it is written iron production, but it's, it's iron alloy production basically. And of course, the, the mining and metallurgy and many other, other things. So that was the first industrial revolution. Now the second industrial revolution was about uh, the mass uh, production. That was a continuous uh, production system. So, so this mass production, production line, correct? And of course the broad adoption of telegraph, gas, water supply, that has brought the second industrial revolution when the idea was to produce so many uh, copies of the same component and supplied to masses. Then the third industrial revolution, so basically this was the time of hard automation. The second industrial revolution was the time of hard automation. Now the third industrial revolution uh, took place when it was a time when this microprocessor was developed developed it was a time when this really there was a development in the field of electronics so with the development of microprocessor it is the human mental effort human mental effort was substituted by these technologies like computer internet digital banking programming logic controllers robotics it digitization automation electronic digital networks and digital machines. So what do we see like in first first industrial revolution, it was the time when when people tried to you know replace the human muscular effort and in third industrial revolution, the mental effort of human was substituted by these technologies. Okay, then what is today? Today like we talk about industrial fourth revolution that is called smart manufacturing. Now today it is the time when this digital technologies have grown tremendously. It is, the, it is a time of information, correct? The information technology and the, the, the information in the digital form that is uh, available a lot and is being generated and being stored digitally. 
So now this is the time that when all this information which is available digitally uh, is utilized uh, and definitely in order to utilize this big information, big digital information, this big data is to be first dealt optimally. It has to be chosen optimally and then it has to be communicated. And of course, this data uh, will be used to make certain decisions in order to operate certain machines. And of course, in order to do all these things, this data which is actually present in the cloud is to be is to be finally you know uh, digged out uh, based on various machine learning and AI algorithms, and this this whole uh, concept in totality is known as cyber physical system. So based on the cyber physical system, the manufacturing is likely to be driven. So today, uh, in Germany, uh, there are a few companies uh, which more or less using this concept and in US also some companies have started using this. In US it is known as smart manufacturing and in Germany this concept is known as industry 4.0. So if you try to see the timeline, the first industrial revolution uh, where the mechanization happened, actually it was the end of the 18th century. And in the beginning of the 20th century, it was the time when people talked about mass production through continuous lines. And the, the, in the beginning of 70th, 1970th, uh, we have tried uh, industrial revolution, through third industrial revolution, uh, that was because of the development of microprocessor electronics, and of course, uh, beginning of IT. And we, we put uh, so so you can realize from these figures. And today uh, we talk about Industry 4.0, where uh, the physical system, cyber physical system, is backbone of Industry 4.0. So I'll explain to you what is cyber physical system. So a cyber physical system, basically, if you see in the core, you have information. Correct? It is basically the digital digital information. And this digital information is to be computed. This is a whole huge information. So this is to be digged out uh, in a very appropriate manner, an appropriate information. And of course, you need to have certain algorithms, maybe AI and ML algorithms uh, to dig out that proper information for your application. And then this information will be communicated to various machines. And of course, then these machines will be accordingly controlled in order to do the manufacturing. So, so this whole thing actually constitute a cyber physical system. So cyber physical system is a system of collaborating computational elements, controlling physical entities. CPS, this uh, cyber physical system are physical and engineered systems whose operations are monitored, coordinated, controlled and integrated by a computing and communicating code. So they allow us to add capabilities to physical systems by merging computing and communication with physical processes. This is something you know which 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 is which constitute the cyber physical system. Now uh, I would like to inform that there has been a lot of emphasis on developing cyber physical systems uh, for various uh, technologies, uh, including uh, manufacturing technology and. It is a thrust area nowadays, uh, and there have been approximately 25 technological technology innovation hubs which have been created by Ministry of or Department of Science and Technology uh, across our country, which we, who, who are likely to actually uh, deliver or, or sponsor various projects to, to various uh, professors or maybe the professionals. Uh, who are likely to develop such systems for, for different kinds of technology and, and of course, in order to, to bring revolution in, in various operations uh, across. So, uh, like if we try to see today's factory, correct? Of course, most of the time when we talk about continuous uh, manufacturing, uh, we, we have to see that uh, the continuous manufacturing that is a production line, 
which is rigidly sequenced is something uh, which is uh, there and is something which is the state of the art so 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 i can you can you can you can probably appreciate uh, from this slide that what do i mean to say right this is this is what is the current technology is but the 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 tomorrow's factory or the future factory is something which is decoupled fully flexible and highly integrated manufacturing systems like here what is likely to happen that uh, this whole thing will be actually driven by cyber physical systems so in cyber physical system the digital information which is present that will be used to if suppose there's a need to fabricate a component so this digital information present in the cloud that will be digged out there will be will, uh, and and what and the various algorithms like artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms they'll be used to to uh, arrive at a optimum decision and that information will be communicated to these various workstations which may be located at uh, different places uh, not uh, they, they are not at one place and then uh, there will be communication of information and these and these machine machines or workstations they will also be communicated with, with each other and finally you are going they are going to produce uh, through manufacturing uh, the final product so this is the kind of future factory which we are trying to imagine or conceive uh, which is decoupled fully flexible and highly integrated okay now the 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 next thing uh, uh, which we talk about uh, is what happened to this okay so uh, uh, now now i would like to describe this uh, six design principles of smart manufacturing so these principles are interoperability that is the ability of cyber physical system humans and smart factories to connect and communicate with each other via internet of things and internet of services and then it is the virtualization so it is the virtualization that is a virtual copy of the smart factory which is created by linking sensor data with virtual plant models and simulation models so basically in virtualization we are having the concepts of augmented reality and the virtual reality so with these tools uh, you will be able to actually simulate uh, the the situations of manufacturing and the, of course again uh, there is a use of various sensors and of course artificial intelligence here then it is the decentralization it is the ability of the cyber physical system within the smart manufacturers to make decisions on their own and then real time capability that is to analyze the data collect the data and provide the insights immediately service orientation has to be there through internet of services and modularity that is flexible adaptation of smart factories for changing requirements of individual models so these are the six design principles of smart manufacturing now then uh, if we try to see the various building blocks of industry 4.0 they include uh, the the uh, we can say they start with the the internet of things horizontal and system a uh, virtual system integration simulation and of course there has to be cyber security uh, robotics or cobotics has to be there big data analytics virtual or augmented reality along with and then additive manufacturing so this additive manufacturing which you are talking today is 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 its use is not limited to uh, what uh, we are discussing and that is on biomedical application it is one of the very specific application uh, and i will definitely going to talk about it in another uh, 15 20 minutes okay so then uh, what today we are talking about that uh, we have to move from digital world to real world through various 
a well-defined actions like product design, production planning, production engineering, production and services, and of course, the simulation, product life cycle management, execution, and the automation, and the data-driven services. So basically, uh, what I want to tell you that this entire value chain is to be digitized and is being integrated so that from the, the virtual world, which is based on the digital data, uh, through these processes, there's a smooth transition from digital to the real world. And finally, we are getting the product uh, for our use. So if you try to see the, the various skill sets which are applicable to, to this kind of uh, manufacturing scenario, then uh, for today's uh, manufacturing, basically the digital set uh, which is to be used or to, which is required is, this, this is the, the most important one is the complex problem solving ability, coordination, critical thinking, I'll say, and uh, decision, and of course the creativity. So, but in, in case of industry 4.0, minimum number of people involvement and of course from this this small figure you can see that it is a highly complex networked uh, manufacturing uh, philosophy so here basically the the emotional intelligence and and of course the cognitive flexibility is something which are which are to be taught to the you know people who are likely to work in this area so that is something uh, which which the university like yours must try to think that these things curricula for the time to come. Okay, so others may are requested to kindly mute their mics. Everybody should mute their mic uh, because they are uh, various voice. Yeah, host may mute everybody, excluding me. Hello. Hello. Am I audible? Hello. Yes, sir, you are audible. Yeah, there is a lot of voice coming. You you may please ask people to mute their mics. Okay. So uh, uh so this is something what I was trying to tell that about the skill sets which which are likely to present on the people. So basically this uh, concept of smart manufacturing is definitely likely to impact the individual society and business economy and of course the various nations across the globe. So this is something uh, which is important uh, to understand. Now uh, I would like to show you uh, like uh, various uh, products people have developed uh, through industry four point uh, through additive manufacturing. So this is what uh, my idea is that I, I must show you a few things. Okay, and then then I'll go back to what I want to tell you. So okay, this additive manufacturing applications. If you try to see, then uh, basically uh, uh, your focus of your FDP has been on the biomedical applications, correct? And I believe that this slide will not be new to you because many speakers might have already spoken about it. So let me spend only one, two minutes on this slide. So what really we try to do here that uh, this digital information, which is a CT and MRI image, CT and MRI images basically, which look like this way, but they're actually the digital images and if you try to you know open these dicom files basically they are called dicom files these files in in software like mimix or simpleware then uh, you will see that uh, you are able to basically convert this entire digital data to stl files and and you can reconstruct this stl file as, as shown in this figure and once this stl file is available to you you are able to actually slice the data and you are able to operate any 3D printer and you are able to uh, make uh, these kinds of medical models uh, for various uh, tissue engineering or maybe the clinical 
uh, medicine applications, uh, which is which is a very interesting application. One of the interesting applications of of uh, uh, this particular thing. So uh, otherwise, uh, we have variety of uh, applications uh, of uh, additive manufacturing, and the applications actually include uh, design. Uh, CAD model verification, visualization of the object, concept, proof of concept, and then various in engineering analysis and planning, you can use them for form and fit, fit uh, testing, a uh, flow analysis, like somebody want to create some, some, some model, uh, some section, it may be an aerofoil section, the different caster and camber or attack angles, and you can put them in, 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 in a, uh, wind tunnel and understand its behavior in terms of drag, in terms of lift, etc. And then uh, the stress distribution, like there are polymers which are sensitive to the polarized light. So if you can deposit them in different uh, geometries and put them in a polarizer bench, uh, you are able to understand the stress pattern over that particular product uh, with, with this uh, methodology. And of course, the biomedical application, which has been focus of this course that uh, this particular FDP. So it is about the surgical operation planning and design and fabrication of custom processes and implants. And then of course, in manufacturing and tooling, there are variety of applications, uh, which includes uh, making molds uh, using using additive manufacturing technology, and then, then uh, using developing casting solutions uh, for sand casting or maybe the, the investment casting. So like investment casting is very well practiced nowadays uh, when like the various industries uh, which are actually casting gold, the, this all modern gold jewelry industry, they are actually making their designs using additive manufacturing or 3D printing and then creating an investment mold out of that and pouring the gold so that you are able to get the different designs. And then you can also uh, make ABM electrodes if you want to actually machine a complex die, uh, which has a typical three-dimensional freeform geometry uh, using uh, in a, any say, a bearing steel or maybe in some sort of die steel. So how to machine that geometry that you need a copper ABM electrode and which can be actually produced uh, by directly or indirectly using this 3D printing technology. Okay. So just have a look on, uh, this is just for glancing, you can have a look on these various medical implants uh, which have been fabricated by additive manufacturing. This is a resection template which has been manufactured by additive manufacturing. And this is again, you can see a model. Then these are uh, 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 medical sector. This is a hip and knee implant, correct? So this hip implant, and uh, this maxillofacial implant, they have been made by a process called EBAM, electron beam additive manufacturing. And these, these three components which you're observing here, they have been made by selective laser melting kind of interior processes. And this particular uh, implant has been fabricated and has been uh, finished because when you do it by SLM, uh, you get this kind of surface, but if you want to really have a very smooth and finished surface, you have to use uh, some abrasive flow finishing kind of processes in order to do it, uh, finish it. Okay, then these are the dental implants. So it is a dental implant which has been fabricated by long, uh, this SLM technology of EOS. And the surface geometry, surface morphology, you can observe from this particular figure. So you can have a feel that the kind of surface morphology, which is, there are dimples, continuous dimples, which, which are very nicely uh, going to get uh, accommodated with the tissues and the, the, the loosening problem of these implants that is not going to happen. This is something which is important. Then there are other engineering applications like, uh, this is a titanium alloy aero engine blade they can be made, they can be repaired using this technology. Then uh, basically, like these are some very complex component as far as the geometry is concerned. So you can just have a look on these components. This is a curved column. It has some internal information also. 
and these are the informations and the geometry and their dimensions you can have a feel so what happens is that you are unable to actually produce these components by any other manufacturing technology i don't i don't say that any other technology is not a good technology all technology are good they have their own benefits in, in different uh, situations of production however this this particular uh, technology uh, which is uh, which is i will say additive manufacturing is beneficial when the situation the geometric situations are highly complex sometimes you have to alloy sometimes you have to make functionally graded material which is metallurgically changing composition uh, components you want to produce in those situations you will never find any other solution than additive manufacturing so so additive manufacturing is something which which provides you the solution in complex situations uh, where other processes cannot go but definitely they are costlier and and they they are not so fast you cannot keep on reproducing the things using this kind of technology but if you you are unable to do any with any other technology some you will most 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 of the time will find that they are able to do it uh, because of their distinctive features so i will i will try to explain you some distinctive features of uh, this additive manufacturing technologies so this is this is a die manufacturing solution uh, which has been done by sln kind of process so some more things uh, uh, just i am glancing through i believe that uh, now because you this is the last day of your ftp uh, you can appreciate uh, these things your own i am not going to explain everything for you so you can have a feel of these things so in order to improve the surface quality you can paint or implant so this this these kinds of solutions uh, are also tried in in case of biomedical applications or implant it is a beautiful artifact which is a plastic artifact created by uh, additive manufacturing so here it is the next generation am so what is the next generation am that we try to create actually the uh, smart components these smart components are embedded with the sensors and you are able to get these things in uh, done through additive manufacturing then then it is quite interesting so geometrical complexity is something which is not a which is not a limitation uh, in case of additive manufacturing so now let me uh, come back to various distinctive features of additive manufacturing okay so so i think you can see this slide additive manufacturing yeah any i, I think you are able to see my slides i am audible also yeah yes sir yes sir we can see additive manufacturing what makes it important correct so the additive manufacturing like these are the distinct distinctive features of additive manufacturing shape complexity correct so am makes it possible to build virtually any shape you can have a look that how complex these shapes are then uh, it is the material complexity so this entire uh, mechanism or system has been developed uh, in one go using a technology called slm kind of technology and then this is a typical porous interconnected pores uh, polymer component which has been created by another technology then uh, this is a functional comp component so you can see that uh, there are functional devices which have been fabricated directly in certain additive manufacturing machines by embedding components and various kinematic joints while these parts are being built so then the next one is the topological optimization it is again a very critical and distinctive feature uh, of am so this topological optimization is something that you can see that this is the machine component but it has been optimized this way and it can be produced uh, using am technology in a very in a very easy way manner so that's how uh, this is another distinctive feature now the part consolidation so like if you make a component if you make an assembly i'll say uh, in if you suppose do it by injection molding you do the six components but if you do using additive manufacturing you are doing it in one part so that's why there's a huge cost, cost reduction this is called part consolidation this is again a distinctive feature now these distinctive features actually they 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 
the, the features of AM such as increased design freedom, customization, topological optimization, part consolidation, make it is a major disruptive technology for supply chain and for spare parts, even for implants I also, also I'll say. So the paradigm of industry four AM is discussed as the technology which can produce spare parts and support maintenance and of course the, the customized component manufacturing and their supply. It can significantly reduce the time to market and also the cost of manufacturing. Okay, now let me come back to, to this is, this is, uh, okay. So now let me come back to some biomedical uh, work uh, which, which we have done at IIT Delhi. So this is uh, very latest work. Uh, still the thesis has not been submitted. Uh, the, the synopsis is over. Our patents have been there and, and we have already patented the algorithm, etc. Okay, so you can see this is a biodegradable polymer uh, cardiovascular stent. Uh, this is an implant basically, correct? So that has been done through solvent uh, cast 3D printing. So basically the 3D printer has been ingeniously developed in our lab. This is a very small 3D printer. The size of the 3D printer will be this much. How much is this? Around 150 millimeters, one feet. So one feet by one feet and the height is also around 1.25 feet we can say. And basically we have a syringe here in which we, we put the the uh, bio ink, the bio ink is synthesized in our lab that we have developed it and it is our composition. And then this bio ink is, is being deposited on this rotating mandrel or rotating rod. The diameter of this rod is very small, maybe 1.5 1, 1 mm to 2 mm. And we are able to deposit through this nozzle, which is a dispensing tip. We are able to uh, deposit basically these kinds of structures. So when we design, we design like this. And when we deposit, we deposit like this. And we are able to actually produce these kinds of implants. And these implants, uh, which are cardiovascular implants, stents basically, they are biodegradable, correct? Now uh, you can see here that there are various kinds of tests which have been performed. So the radial compression load and the bending load that has been uh, uh, tested and then uh, the ballooning has also been done uh, the way it is being done in angioplasty uh, in order to understand its behavior when it is expanded and uh, when it is being implanted in, in an artery. So uh, this is this is the stent behavior do, during balloon expansion. So stent diameter, how it increases and the pressure uh, which is applied from here. So that's how you can have a feel of that, how it really changes. Then it is the biological studies and the biodegradation studies. So what did we do? We, we have developed this setup. This setup is basically a dynamic degradation system uh, where uh, this, this is a simulated body fluid. There's a simulated body fluid here. And on in the silicon rubber, basically the stems are being placed. And this is the pump. This is a parastatic pump through which uh, we are mimicking the, the pumping action of the heart and we are understanding that how the degradation is taking place. So which has been plotted here. So basic, and then uh, uh, because it is a biodegradable uh, material uh, and it has to be, uh, it has to be bio, bio, in, uh, bio uh, friendly and it, it is to be degrade and the cell addition has to take place. So this, uh, these, all these studies, biological studies have been conducted in order to establish that it is biologically stable and non-toxic and of course degrading, degrading also with the time. Okay, then uh, let me talk about, uh, uh, I, I, I'm directly coming now to the porous biodegradable iron implant uh, using 3D printing and pressureless microwave sintering. So, so this is something uh, which has been very recently done in our lab. The, uh, the student has already graduated. We have patents for it and we have, we have developed the process and material too. So here basically the idea is that these are the pure iron uh, uh, scaffolds, correct? 
So this is a CAD model and it is stereolithography 3D printed template. And then it is a typical material which has been developed and this is a mold here. So this is here inside it. Then we are putting it in a furnace and we are actually evaporating it. We are getting this mold cavity, filling this mold cavity with spherical iron part, carbon and iron particles and then basically doing the pressureless micro sintering and we are getting these very structures. So, so they, they are highly accurate uh, in dimensions and the tolerances are maintained within IP16 grades. So you can see here, this is the study uh, which has been done. Uh, this is a case study that is fabricated with customer's kapoor for human skull, uh, which we have developed. And then uh, there's a degradation study, which has also been carried out. So for different kinds of samples, uh, uh, we could show that the, the we are, basically in iron, we have to increase the degradation rate. So because that, that's a problem. So that we have done. And then this is a cytocompatibility assay test, which talks about the, the biologically stable and uh, behavior of these stains. Then it is another important uh, contribution, which is again very, very recent. So ultrasonic assisted pressureless sintering for rapid manufacturing of uh, copper components. So these uh, uh, copper uh, components uh, are made, uh, though you cannot say that these are implants, but obviously in this, uh, using the same principle, we have developed uh, our zinc-based uh, biodegradable implants and scaffolds, porous scaffolds, and also magnesium uh, material, which is, uh, which is mixed with uh, some other uh, constituents. You can see my paper, so you will appreciate these things in a very nice way. So they have been developed and you can see the process here. Like here, uh, the process uh, is similar like in the beginning, but later on actually it is the ordinary furnace. Now it is ordinary to furnace in an ordinary environment. And this is the novelty part that it is basically this crucible on which this is the sintering is being taken place is being ultrasonically vibrated. So this is a complete horn design, which you can see here. So this is a horn design and we have the FEM adjustments, FEM simulations. And of course we have created this, this uh, horn. And this is the, the, the mold boat basically where we have, this is this component is being kept here and uh, it is being in, in, in this inside, we are actually vibrating it. So these are the very, these are the various components. Yeah, again, there are some voice actually. Uh, so this is the... Yeah. Uh, Please mute the, yourself, all participants. Please mute yourself. So, so these are the various uh, fabricated, very complex scaffold shapes. Though uh, uh, they can be used for, because they're copper one, so they can be used for various other applications, including the sometimes heat, uh, heat sink kind of things. Sometimes uh, they are used for shock absorption, etc., etc. And we have also developed a model, basically, that is a neck growth uh, kinetics, uh, which we have developed in this work. Okay, then uh, another uh, very important contribution which have been uh, from our side, uh, that is a development of club foot orthosis, correct? So this club foot orthosis is uh, something uh, that the problem you can understand this this uh, twisted fit the baby is born with this twisted fit so these are the mri scans are taken and basically we have made these uh, twisted fits now uh, for six kids on on uh, using uh, additive manufacturing technology and that is not directly made additive manufacturing there's silicon rubber uh, the silicon rubber is a material which is whose properties are analogous and you can correlate them with the properties of uh, this uh, called cartilages. So these are the foot models basically on which the experiments were performed, which have been made by additive manufacturing and rapid casting, rapid tooling mode. Then basically this, this is the orthosis which was developed. And we have actually conducted the clinical trials also on a number of kids. And we could establish that application of this orthosis is able to actually morph these foots. 
we are able to correct that geometry uh, within seven to ten days in, in most of the cases. Then uh, it is the club foot uh, deformity measurement device. So you can see here that this is the device which we have developed, and there are variety number of scales: so scale one, two, three, four, five. So only seven scales are there. So once you put on the foot of the baby, you are able to get basically seven numbers. And once the correction is taking place, when you apply this orthosis, you can have an assessment that how many, how much correction has taken place, and how the the the, the deformation or the deformity is being. Uh, being corrected. So this is something uh, which is one of the uh, quite uh, in interesting work which we have done. Okay, so this this is something about uh, biomedical which I would like to tell it to you. Okay, so this is uh, uh, this is uh, I think uh, I have done uh, my job here. So let me thank everyone for your patient hearing uh, about various contributions uh, from my side. And uh, I, I believe that time allotted to me, I have already spoken for 45 minutes, 50 minutes or so. So this is this is good for you, your course. And uh, I believe that I could cover a variety of fields in this specific time. And, uh, if you have any question, you can discuss with me. Uh, okay, so thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Palak Mohan, Professor Palak Mohan Pandey, for such a wonderful talk. And uh, I hope the participants must have enjoyed the talk. I really enjoyed your talk. And uh, uh, there are a few questions in the chat box, and I would like to ask you. There is one question from Mr. Niranjan Chatterjee, who says that suppose for a bone implant, we have to achieve same bulk and surface property as a bone. For that, if we optimize a composite in the lab, then is it possible to use this composite as ink for 3D printing? Actually, uh, you can definitely, composite is a different thing. Ink is a different thing. And whether you will be able to dissolve it in certain solvent, uh, which is not a, a troublemaking solvent for human, then you can definitely do it. But uh, what this is a very open-ended question, actually. Right? This is a very open-ended question. Uh, you, I can answer only if, if you bring the composite to me and we do a lot of trials in our lab. Then only a, a proper answer can be given because it is a very open-ended question. Yeah. Sir, the next question is, if possible, how material will be processed for preparing ink? I think that's the continuation of the same question. Yeah, so generally, uh, the, there's a, there are certain solvents in which these polymers are being dissolved. Like uh, we are doing another work, which I have not presented here. There's a, we are actually making uh, this uh, PLA and uh, polyurea thin, PU. PLA and PU, and we are also mixing certain, uh, sometimes certain very fine particles of magnesium or zinc, or sometimes we are also mixing nanoparticles with it. So that ink, uh, we are able to actually, so you have to actually study that ink, the, the rheological properties of that ink. And then you have to actually slow the so uh, see the flowability when you are putting in the syringe and when when that is that that is being pumped and whether it is flowing or not and how much time it is taking uh, when it is being deposited so how much evaporation of the solvent takes place all those things are important so when you change uh, material when you change composition uh, you have to to do a lot of experiment that is that. Your, your experimental abilities and your experience will play a role that how in how much less number of hit and trials you are able to come to a composition or you are able to come to a proper composition that it can, it can flow or it, can, or it is able to do the printing or not. So the ink preparation is something uh, which requires a lot of experience. And this is what I would like to tell at this point. Yeah. Any other question? Sorry. 
sorry i was muted so the next question is from dr kamlesh wader he is asking you in pharma sector how much time it will take to be in routine practice for what yeah the question is a bit not clear can you specify for what dr kamlesh manufacturing of dosage he writes sir doses means which dose is he talking about medicines or 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 implants i am not able to clear he he must actually he please specify clearly sir personalized doses he is saying yeah personalized doses of medicines actually there are attempts like one student uh, from a i think she was doing m pharma she visited our lab and in the in the same bioprinter she has she has you know uh, she has uh, deposited i'll say or developed uh, one tablet kind of thing uh, which was actually made of different uh, medicines and the idea was that the there the, there was a sequence of dissolution so that also we tried to control so that is a kind of control doses which can be given so obviously uh, these problems can be researched and if there is a particular requirement from any pharmacy pharmaceutical company or maybe from, designed by any doctor then these things can be done but of course these 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 all are you know uh, open ended question where a research is needed uh, to do this Thank you so much, Professor Pandey. Now I would like to have the second speaker of our session, Dr. S. Kanagaraj. Dr. S. Kanagaraj was appointed as an associate professor and professor in 2012 and 2017, respectively. He received his PhD degree from the Institute of Technology, Kharagpur, in 2004. He did his postdoctorate at the University of Ivorio, Portugal, till May 2008, and then he has been with the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the Indian Institute of Technology, Guwahati, since 2008. His research interests include biomedical device, biomaterials, assistive technology device, processes and assistive and materials characterization. He has received many awards, including Bairab Sushti Award 2016, National Servo Award for the Best Innovator at the 7th Indian Innovation Initiative I3 National Fair 2015, Award under MLM category for Gandhian Young Technological Innovation, I'm sorry, for Young Journal and Conference Paper. One US patent was granted and four Indian patents were applied. Three students completed their PhD and ad addition one postdoc doctorate fellow. He has completed eight projects as a PI worth of about rupees 4.5 crore. He completed one consultancy project, four projects as co-PI. He started one startup company, Masses Assistive Device Technology Private Limited, Guwahati. I welcome Dr. S. Kanagaraj to the platform to present his speech on the topic 3D printing for development of material. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your invitation. Uh, very good morning, Dr. Kanagraj. Okay. Uh, good morning, good morning. Hope you are all doing fine. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, yes, I have forwarded that uh, presentation. Otherwise, I will share my. There is no option for sharing the slide. Okay. Uh, sir, they will give you the rights now. No, that sharing option is not there. Sir, they will give you now. Okay, okay, fine, fine. Sir, have you got it, sir? No.
Otherwise, you can share it. I have forwarded the mail to you. Professor Pandey, good morning. Good morning. Hope you are doing fine. Yeah, yeah. I was, uh, yeah, yeah. Hello, Jay, are you there? Can you give sharing rights to Dr. Kanagraj to present? Hello. Yes, come easy. Sorry for delay, sir. So, hope you can see the slide. Yes, sir. Ah, fine. So, in the meantime, I will uh, skip that uh, video so that uh, clarity will be good. Good morning, students. Uh, sorry, good morning, pa participants. Okay. So first of all, uh, thank you for inviting me. Okay. And uh, I'll be talking about uh, development of a solid embolization material using 3D printing. Okay, which is being used, uh, which is proposed to be used for the treatment of aneurysm. And uh, the uh, work, what we have been doing with the 3D printing, I will uh, discuss about it. And after that, if time permits, then I will briefly overview. I uh, give overview about what are the other kind of activities we have been doing it. Okay. And before as we are working on a medical device, you will, though you will be knowing it, this as per the WHO standard, what is that medical device and all like that. It can be of uh, any instrument, apparatus or machine, appliance and all which can be used for diagnostic purpose or for preventive or monitoring or a treatment or elevation of disease and pain or for the treatment for injury and ours comes under that uh, what you can say for the treatment of aneurysm okay though you'll be knowing it this is from a who standard if you see that what is the definition of medical device that's what you can able to see here and uh, why we wanted to work on that before that just i think about i thought of giving about a small background okay this is what our uh, medical device import okay you just see here in 2014-15 it is about uh, 23,000 money uh, crore was spent on importing the device and uh, recently it is a nine, up to nine, 2018 to 19 statistical data it is about a 30 about nine, 39,000 crore has been spent for importing the biomedical devices among them you just see that a 30 percentage comes under the diagnostic imaging devices like a MRI and a CT scan and x-ray and all like that and other medical devices comes about a 24 consumable is the 60 only the chemicals what is being used in a medical medical in a hospital and all like that 16 percent of it among that 40, near about 39,000 to 16 percent is mainly used for a consumables and IV diagnostics and the patient aid and all like that okay so we can target wherever that we can uh, suppose as being a implant if you are talking about implant it takes uh, near about a 10 years to go into the market and if you think about uh, some exoskeleton devices like a patient aid 
and uh, uh, prosthetic devices and all like that then as soon as you develop it you can go for a testing okay uh, just one hello ah no no i am in a meet ah. no no i am not with you i am in a meeting i will call you back can't take okay so if you use it for exoskeleton devices and all as soon as your development is ready then you can take approval from institute or animal institute ethical committee then you can go for testing with the patient and all like that okay and this one so here that uh, as we are talking about endovascular embolization okay what do you mean by endovascular embolization okay first you can see here this is the normal blood vessels in the blood vessel at some portion of the blood vessel though we say that uh, the blood vessel will vary it will be having uniform characteristic uniform uh, uh, properties what one particular place at this particular point here you see here sorry here or there you can see that that uh, blood vessel lost its uh, stiffness or lost its uh, strength due to that what will happen due to the blood pressure and due to the loss of its characteristics then that the size of that particular portion will try to enlarge like that okay you can see here this enlarged portion because at that neck portion initially the material that the blood vessel lost its features or characteristics due to some disease or it we cannot say why it is happening just only at the particular part rest of the places it will it is remain intact okay fine then if it is a keep on increasing what will happen at one particular point of time this is a, this are all what you can say this is a blood vessel it is something like a balloon kind of it okay that if you are pumping air into that system balloon it will up to some extent it can able to hold it beyond that it will burst if it is burst then and one more problem is that there will be no there's no uh, there is no diagnosis or the patient will not feel any symptoms of that aneurysm this is called aneurysm okay the patient will not get any feeling of any symptoms for that so what will happen to once it is fractured then a blender blood loss will be happening it will be moved. then a patient will die before he has taken to the hospital okay mostly this problem happening in the brain okay that brain hemorrhage and all like that that is what the patient will die before he has taken to the hospital okay then how it is being treated that is what the embolization it is the occlusion of blood vessels by purposely introducing an embolic okay that is the embolic material will be introduced in that aneurysm zone okay so generally what is being done it is a through minimal invasive surgery uh, that uh, with the femoral artery they make a puncture and they will be inserting that material or that uh, treatment protocol whatever they do they will be doing it here okay from there okay and uh, this is uh, endovascular embolization it is being used for the treatment of aneurysm and arteriovenous malformation and the certain kind of tumor and uh, what is the treatment protocol for that these are the different uh, problems existing here you can see here this is the different type of and uh, different aneurysms okay you can hear there will be a circular kind of it the size will get enlarged and that uh, fusi bomb here you can see and this particular form and here there is a pseudo aneurysm okay so most of the time they will go keep a uh, what you can say a stent in between okay in within that particular portion they will use a blood vessel and uh, they will ensure that there will be a, a clotting around that okay then the perfect blood flow will be happening okay but these are all why we need to go for minimally invasive treatment because sometimes the blood vessels where that aneurysm is happening that will not be accessible from that open surgery so that is what most of the time it will go for that uh, minimally invasive surgery okay and this what that it bulges that occur in the arteries due to weak uh, due to that a blood vessel it will be weakened at that particular place okay that rupture i already say, said it a hemorrhage will be happening due to that there will be death okay there will be commonly it occur in aorta or in the most sometimes uh, most of the time it is in the brain okay that is what in rest of the places they can able to do something but here in, it will be very difficult also okay if you talk about the statistical data okay so among 6 million one in uh, we don't have any indian data that's what we have taken with data from the us okay so one in 50 people in us having unruptured brain aneurysm okay it means we don't know what is the rate at which it grow okay even if it is growing whether that uh, 
the blood vessels at that aneurysm part whether it is going to lose its uh, it is going to reach its uh, fracture point or the rupture point and all like that okay because it is something like a uh, silicon rubber kind of it is it, it elongate like anything but depending on the strain but at one point of time it will rupture okay then you can see that annual rate of brain aneurysm rupture is uh, 30000 though there are 6 million billion million people saw there and there it is available in a different age groups from 35 to 60 most productive age is coming within that so within that period that aneurysm happening and the people will die okay then almost worldwide about 5 lakh death is happening every year okay due, just due to that aneurysm okay these are the some of the statistical data okay just maybe we can see this slide and these are that uh, they are the what you can say people who are reported to uh, they were died because of that ruptured aneurysm okay mm -hmm. scott and zoology dolly and the france afford each other's name after him that albert einstein and indian report also uh, first prime minister jawaharlal nehru died because of that in some of the literature i saw i don't know whether it is correct or not okay and uh, this one even uh, most of the time the people will die that is what the 40 percentage of it and uh, only 20 percentage will have a recovery but in recovery also they may have uh, some permanent uh, uh, defamation or permanent uh, what you can say uh, disability at some part of their come part of their body in apart from that 40 percentage will have the neurological disease okay somewhere it is going to touch the nerves and there will be permanent damage on that so that life will be somewhat it is uh, that in a previous life cycle they cannot able to get it if they have aneurysm and the it is and that also it is a rupture okay what is that uh, uh, what you can say standard protocol or the operating procedure is being done they are going to use the mechanical system here you can see they are using the clipping okay then they use the bypass okay bypass they will use and where they will use a mechanical uh, clipping or they will use a stent or a plastic mechanism However, the body limitation, though this is successful, there is apart from the surgical complication, the accessibility of that blood vessel is, is an issue and uh, uh, whether it is easy to access if you do it in open surgery, okay, if it is a, in case of brain and all like that, it will be very much, it will be not, it very much difficult. That is what that interventional radiology came into picture, okay. And due to that only, these are all one of the possible treatments okay you can use that uh, endovascular coils this one this is a platinum coil they uh, they will be inserting through the femoral artery and it is uh, at the end it is attached with the catheters and you can able to reach the desired location and it is something like a wire mesh kind of it if these are all uh, though this is a metal they made in the form of a mesh okay soft uh, foam kind of it so once it is inserted and it goes through the blood vessel as you anyhow you will be steering it from outside okay and it will go inside and it will be filling that entire aneurysm so what will happen due to that volume that blood flow into the aneurysm will be getting reduced then if it is the blood is reduced then what will happen that enlarging of the aneurysm will be getting stopped or it will be rate of growth will be very very minimal okay this is for a solid embolic material another one is a liquid embolic material that is the onyx is being used it is some kind of a liquid and that liquid will be injected into that aneurysm zone and as soon as it comes in contact with uh, ionic liquid like uh, blood then they start to uh, what you can say they become a solid okay and that solid they can expand in such a way that it can you can able to fill that entire aneurysm volume so that as it is a block, so there won't be anything to go. So the blood will go into the normal uh, blood vessels. Here we need to know what is the exact volume of that aneurysm and uh, we need to know what is that expansion rate of that particular embolic material. Then only otherwise if uh, volume is, if the quantity is a little bit more, then it will go into that uh, main line. Then it will disturb the path. Okay. This is the way it is being uh, presently it is treated. Eviol and ethylene alcohol, cyanoclidase, acrylate, and all it is being used. And this is what you can see when you are doing a catheter angiogram. This is what data is taken from that Negrins Hospital, that Northeastern Indira Gandhi Regional Institute of Health and Medical Science, where Dr. Akas Handik is there. He is an intervention radiologist. He is my PhD student also. Okay. 
So this is what you can see here that uh, 13 days after that. Okay, so most probably uh, this is from his data only if I'm right. Okay, this is a uh, six mm aneurysm you can see here at this particular point. Just it is highlighted. And after 13 days you just see here it is grown. So you can see if at all it keep on growing it is going to affect that nearby nerves nearby nerves also it is going to affect that is what there is a permanent uh, what you can say disorder kind of it even the person is not going to die and what are the different embolic agents are being used as the authorities have shown that is all solid embolic material liquid embolic material and uh, and particulate in case of a liquid embolic material that onyx or squid these are the most commercially used device okay but they are very much expensive and other devices ethanol also NVC also it is being used in case of mechanical device that is a mechanical coils balloons plugs and all the grafting and all it comes under that that the major issue is that a medical device if you wanted mechanical device if you wanted to use you should act you must have the provision to access the blood vessel where aneurysm is there okay then third one is the particulate, the PVA and all it is being used for that. And uh, what we have been working on that here, instead of this a coil, solid embolic material, so here the major purpose is to just arrest the blood flow into that. Just you need some material to fill it in the tunnelism, then a platinum coil and all like that, it is a bit expensive. So we start of going as a solid embolic material using a shape memory polymer. Being a polymer, the radio pack will not be there. So you need to make, uh, you need to blend with uh, some uh, radio pack material like a barium sulfate or hydroxyapatite and all like that. So one of the radio pack materials, so that once you are inserting through the catheters, so you can able to monitor how it is moving forward. And whether you are, it is reaching in that proper direction or not. After reaching that, then you fill it that aneurysm zone, then you can detach that uh, Shapamari coil and Shapamari material and you can bring it. The advantage is that, so once you take from that uh, angiogram, if you take that, uh, the particular volume of it, you know, you just estimate what is the volume. So based on that, you make a 3D modeling and get that uh, volume printed using a 3D printing. We are using a 3D printing for that one only. Okay, then get that volume. Then after that, then the, using Shapamari polymer. Because shape-memory polymer, that as you know, that the FDM technique, you need to have wire. So, but uh, whatever it is available in the form of pellet, so you have to make, you have to convert that pellet in the form of wire. Okay. Then after that, then that wire is used in a 3D printer. Then you can get in the form of a shape. So you know that this is being a polymer and it is undergoing a two different thermal cycle. One is with. Uh, with is with the extrusion uh, what you can say to get a form of from pallets to the wire then wire to that aneurysm shape so two times when it is moving so whatever the properties suggested by the companies that may not be there so we need to do a lot of research before we plan to use it okay this anyhow this is a shape memory polymer so you might have already know there is a uh, hard point and the soft point will be there there is a nodal point will be there okay so initially you make the uh, product uh, above its melting point, you get the desired shape that is a permanent shape of that like aneurysm coil kind of it. Then you bring down the temperature, you make a temporary shape which can be attached with a catheter while you are inserting through the femoral artery. And once it reaches that uh, aneurysm zone, then it will come back to the original shape like aneurysm, that internal volume of the aneurysm. And after that, you detach that catheter and you can remove that. So here, we need to know how much, uh, what is the rate of expansion, how much is there. That is what I said about that. So you need to have that, uh, when you are making a second, permanent shape is that aneurysm volume, whatever the shape of it. And the second shape, that permanent shape is getting converted in the form of wire. That will be attached. And once you are insert, once that material is inserted through the femoral artery, then as it is going under that, uh, what you can say, temperature, here that external stimuli is the temperature. Okay, that's what the secondary deformation, you need to keep it at very low temperature, then uh, it's a transition temperature. Here the transition temperature of the polymer is around 35 degrees centigrade. 
So the blood is around 30 centigrade, the body temperature is 37 degrees centigrade. So you don't need any external stimuli. Only with the body temperature itself, the blood temperature itself, you can able to bring that original uh, shape of it. Then it try to expand. Then at, we need to ensure that uh, that is not that the material, whatever it is getting in, injected or what is inserted, it should not get the original shape with, before it reaches the uh, desired location. So we should have a sufficient time. Okay. So that a rate of expansion of that material should be, we need to have a control over it so that at least we have a sufficient time before it reaches that uh, aneurysm portion. Okay. This is what the, how does it work and all this. Okay. How that uh, shape is getting deployed and all like that. And this one, how we are doing that. Uh, this one is the, how we are making the pellets, a uh, composite pellet. As I said earlier, this is a uh, shape memory polymer. And the polymer is not having a radioactive characteristic, so you need to add some materials. Okay, a radioactive material. Either you can use a barium sulfate, which is well established one, which is being used with a PMMA for a bone cement application or for a diagnosis, diagnostic treatment in the stomach and all like that. It is already well established uh, uh, biocompatible material, so either you can use a barium sulfate or you can we can <coughs> plan to use that uh, hydroxyapatite. Hi, why did we choose? We have used both. Okay, so why did we use that hydroxyapatite? It is something like that. Uh, from the literature, we saw that uh, it is going to induce some kind of inflammation for the clot. Well, some kind of inflammation. That is why the concentration was kept very low, so that uh, that inflammation which induces the blood clotting within the aneurysm zone, we can explore. We can exploit that kind of features. Okay, that is what one uh, we have also made that hydroxyapatite also. Okay, and another as we need to we no need to have any solid compound. Okay, if the material is having a foam type, then we can able to reduce the quantities being used. Okay, that is what it is a foam type. So foam type if you are making it in a polymer and all like that, so you need to add some porogens during that fabrication process. Here we have used a sodium chloride and a filler as a tungsten. We have used as a filler element. Okay. That is a different study we did and this is the initial study just we are focusing on it okay the tungsten is being used as a radio packed material and the sodium chloride is being used as a porogen because after that it will be recovered so that uh, what you can say there won't be any uh, it will be four without any sodium chloride in the final product okay and this is what both we have mixed the porogens and the filler we have mixed in acetone after the once it is mixed properly that the solution was mixed with the polymer pellet and it was stirred and uh, with and it was above material uh, as it is acetone simply by heating it it can evaporate okay then after that we ensured that the porogen and it is having a kind of coating over that okay coating over the polymer that coated polymer was used in an uh, in a twin screw extruder we can see here this uh, twin screw extruder was that this is a co-rotating twin screw extruder where it has a four different temperature zones and here once we you mix it here that due to high shear there will be a perfect blending of uh, polymer the porogens and the filler material you will have a homogeneous dispersion of it then after that here there will be the here you will get in the form of a wire and once it is cooled then after that it will be uh, palletizer it once it passed through that palletizer then you will have it in the form of a pellet because why did we make it because this was used in a compression molding machine to get a test sample for its characteristics okay because we, when you are going to use it for a 3d printing here you are going to get a final product so before that we need to ensure that the materials are having a, a desired characteristics even after the 3d printing also we have tested it so because here if the material has passed through one what you can say, uh, heating cycle. <coughs> okay. And after that, where we are going to get that final product, composite product, after you get that, uh, that extrusion, you will get a comp composite filament. And here, as soon as you are going to get that filament, we are collecting it. Because just after cooling it, you will have it in the form of wire. That wire was used in a 3D printer so that the composite filament can be used here. Okay. 3D printer and after you get a product then we were going doing that leaching process because we have used the salt as a uh, porogen agent okay then that has to be removed 
Uh, we have explored a different and uh, that the salt was one of that uh, for, for performing agent and after removing all that we have tested it also how much we are adding it how much was retrieved from that uh, leaching process we have checked everything then after that whatever you will be getting it that is a custom shaped composite foam product that can be attached with the catheter and all you can do that uh, trial in vitro trial before we go to that animal study and all this is what the methodology by which we are proposing to do okay we have been doing that okay so the thing is that when you are using a tungsten and this one and this a polyurethane whatever that a medical grade whatever that a grade we have purchased it they are hydrophobic in nature and this one uh, uh, glass tension temperature of this material is totally depending on the uh, moisture content of the polymer okay though we have uh, that was a raw material is having that uh, transition temperature of 35 so after it is absorbed when we could uh, when after that uh, this was not even reported also okay so we could uh, after we make the test sample and all like that the characteristics were not up to the mark when we were thinking what could be the probable reasons and all like that and uh, finally we found one of the reasons could be the moisture absorption then after that we have uh, once that five filament or that uh, pellet were obtained, then we have started to store it in a oven so that there won't be any moisture absorption. Okay, and during that initial process also for a tungsten, we have faced some problems. That is what we have started to use that barium sulfate and that hydroxide also. Okay, as the process I already explained, we have passed through the melt extrusion and injection molding to get the test sample. And as it is, we are planning to use for biomedical application and always it passed through the sterilization. So we need to see that effect of sterilization on the material characteristics also. Then we need to go for a radiography study, aging, degradation, material characteristics, shape memory and all like that. That's what we have been doing it. This is a part, we have, the work is going on. Okay, we are doing a part of that. Part of the results are being reported here. Okay, and this is what, <coughs> though it is an enlarged version of it, okay, it will not be up, that aneurysm is not up to that big one. If it is that, definitely the patient will die. Okay, so this is what, what we are exploring is that with a, we try to make a shape polymer based, pure polymer based some kind of aneurysm shape or pipe or something like that. So that when you are making a composite and all like that, this for a hand on experience what we have made it there. Okay, so we could able to make that some kind of aneurysm shape then after that we could able to make a, a what you can say that with aneurysm, aneurysm shape. This is what uh, that filament, whatever we got it from the extruder, twin spray extruder. This is a pure SML shape memory polymer filament and uh, with 50% uh, is sodium chloride and 43% uh, is sodium chloride and 7% uh, is tungsten. Okay. These are that uh, filament wire what we got it. And this we have tested it uh, and after that uh, one of uh, that one, so some sample also we have used hydroxide also with a different concentration. Okay, this is what that a different sample you can see here. This is at 2.5 uh, percentage, 5 percent, uh, 5 percentage of all of we have made it at our lab only. Nanobarium sulfate and nano hydroxide. Okay, and this is a 10 weight percentage, 7.5 percentage. Okay, then this is uh, barium sulfate. Okay, and uh, this one you can see here earlier we have made it in the form of a, the permanent shape was in the form of a strip and. Uh, after as it is a transient temperature is 35 we have uh, brought down lower than a 35 and we have made a temporary shape like a rolled kind of it at less than 20 uh, maybe around a 20 degrees centigrade and after that this was kept in the uh, hot water around 40 degrees centigrade because that uh, transient temperature is 35 degrees centigrade so if you keep it above that it will uh, come back to the original shape okay you can see here uh, after that 40 degrees temperature heat rise so that you can see here okay some kind of what you can say it is not up to the 100 percentage recovery was not up there okay then also it is uh, if it is meets our requirement then it is fine that's what it is what is we notice is that the shape fixity was not affected by the addition of nanoparticles whether it is a white of subordinate or nanobarium sulfate and the shape recovery was reduced by 8 percentage if we use a 12.5 percentage of otherwise the rest of the things it is working okay 
and that uh, nanoparticles it is going to affect that shape like that's what we could we are not able to whatever we could able to achieve it with the pure polymer we could not able to achieve it however as by adding that nanoparticle we could able to ensure that increase in radio opacity uh, and uh, because the mechanical property is not an issue because as your purpose is going to restrict the blood flow as a obstructor flow obstructor that's what you can say here okay yeah, at least if you could able to withstand the shear force whatever it is going to be generated due to the flow then it meets the requirement and after that we made a block okay this is about uh, salt uh, that's for in chloride in the block and this is for uh, with a tungsten and all like that okay then after it was filled with a sodium and it was a salt leaching process was done then this is what you can see here okay this is a leached porous uh, porous component of shapeomeric polymer and this is with the salt and the tungsten once you remove that uh, salt this is a porous tungsten shapeomeric polymer composite okay so we could able to remove 99 point now only little bit was left out okay where we have there is a closed porosion close to pore and all like that there only it was left but uh, we could able to recover all the uh, sodium chloride whatever we have used it and this study this we have made a shape to check that the shape uh, recover uh, what you can say leaching process how it is effective and all like that this is what the shape recovery we have studied shape memory study we have studied with uh, tungsten uh, uh, tungsten and saw, uh, sodium chloride and the shape memory polyurethane okay here initially we have made the shape of a cube of 1 cm 1 cm 1 cm cube using a 3d this is 3d printed product okay okay so uh, whatever that uh, prevents precautions are to be taken uh, to avoid the moisture and all like that everything was taken care and after that we have made that a uh, temporary shape a uh, permanent shape of 1 cm cube and after that the sample was uh, compressed once uh, after when after below the transition temperature okay the, as you know that the transition temperature was for 35 then the trans it was brought down to 30 degree or something like that then it was compressed one of its side was reduced to 0.5 mm you can see here this is the earlier it is one centimeter cube this is one centimeter one centimeter in the 0.5 mm okay sorry this is a 0.5 centimeter okay it is a 5 mm thickness then this sample was kept in a hot water bath at a 60 degree centigrade then as soon as you put then due to that compression what happened that the density of the material also got increased compared to this okay then what happened due to the density rise it has the went to the directly drop or uh, went to the bottom of the beaker okay then slowly slowly once it uh, maybe it is a 0.5 seconds 0.25 seconds uh, sorry 25 seconds 40 seconds 60 seconds then you can see here at each and every time we have observed how the sample size is getting enlarged and all like that okay then after 120 seconds then once it is more or less it is the approximate size of that initial sample then what happened uh, the density got increased because the size got increased then it is start to come out of on the uh, bottom of it then it was started to floating over it okay floating it has come nearer to that beaker and all like that from here okay then after that uh, after 180 seconds and all like that then there is not much uh, what you can say size in a, uh, uh, bring back what is original shape of it whatever it is supposed to be achieved here here more than 90 percent we achieved it here 95 90 like that only so it means within three to four seconds we can able to achieve the desired shape or that a permanent shape once it is inserted into the body or once it is exposed to the body environment uh, in other way we have only three to four minutes time before it reaches the desired location if we could be able to reach it this system will work and if it is if you need more time then we need to play with that in what way we can able to ensure that it may take that exact shape will take because if that enlarged shape it is going it is going to disturb the pathway of the blood vessels so we need to ensure that it takes to sufficient time before it reaches that uh, sufficient time to uh, gain its original shape so that we can able to reach the desired destination that is what that the plan 
Okay, that's what you can see here. This is a before, this is a per permanent shape, and it is a temporary shape, and this is a program temp uh, after recovery. We got able to get the same size and everything like that. Okay, that's what we got from three to four minutes time. And as <clears throat> you know that we are planning as being a polymer, it is a radioactive features are very poor. So we need to add some kind of a radioactive material. That is what we started with the tungsten. Then uh, start after that we went for the uh, barium nano barium sulfate and the nano hydroxide. This is what that comparison as per that uh, ASTM standard. This is the uh, aluminium sample. Okay. This aluminum sample, this will be one, this part is a 1 mm, 2 mm, 3 mm, like that, it will be having come some kind of steps. Okay, here it is a 10 mm. Okay, you can see here when aluminum is having a 10 mm depth, how that light intensity, and it is a 1 mm depth and all, 1 mm thickness, it is see here, how it does it vary its uh, intensity. Okay, so you can able to compare it here. This is what that uh, porous tungsten, it is about a 0.75 mm thickness here tungsten is added you just see here okay and after that this is only that a porous smp you can see here so you, you can just see with the focus then only you can able to identify its the shape and all like that okay then it's a 3d printed one and this is a porous tungsten okay it is about 1.5 mm thickness okay that's what you can able to see that uh, intensity so that you can see when you, because they will, they, when you are inserting it, it will be always under monitoring, X-ray monitoring will be happening or there may be a, another way fluorescent monitoring and here we have followed that X-ray technique. So we can see that where the material is. Then only you can able to maneuver it uh, properly to the desired location. Okay. That's what with the different thickness and all like that. And this is <coughs> that the compression molded sample also we have tested it. Here you can see that a platinum wire what is being used as a solid embolic material. Okay, this is what that platinum wire, once you are seeing it under X-ray, it will be like that only. Okay, this is unopened strain, the strain material, whatever it is going to be inserted. And this is for onyx material, and this is a tantalum powder. This is a tantalum powder, and this is onyx. Okay, and these are the test sample, which was prepared using that compression molding technique and we have cut the sample also with a different concentration of that reinforcement barium sulfate okay so you can see here this is that pure polymer not it cannot be seen clearly and you can able to see it at least that intensity could uh, sample you can able to see it when it is at 10 or 12.5 and all like that okay and this is that a platinum wire what is being used for the uh, aneurysm coil and this one is liquid and this is solid embolic material and the tantalum sometimes this one is and this is tantalum and one will be mixed together to have that and this next comes under that mechanical uh, the characterization of it okay so <coughs> though that the mechanical characterization are not that much desired important because as it is it is not going to carry the load only that the maximum load it comes is due to the blood pressure there may be some shear. So if that proposed material could able to bear that uh, shear, uh, because as we, it is a group kind of it, okay, the thing is that it will, it should not break away in between and if, if it is a broken, then it will be carried away with the blood flow. That is what uh, it will not, it should, at least the shear strength should be higher enough than uh, the shear stress, whatever it is going to be generated by the blood flow, okay. And as you know that that uh, that approximate is a 0 0.5 to 0 0.6 times of relation 0 0.5 if you even if you take okay of its unit point okay that is what we found it the that the mechanical properties are not much uh, it is not at all getting deteriorated so properties will be safe it will not fracture during its uh, application that's what we wanted to see whether you are going to use a hydroxyapatite composites or it is a barium sulfate composite okay we have we have used a uh, nano barium sulfate and a micro micro barium sulfate and hydroxapatite and after that we have a mixed hybrid composite we have mixed both the hydroxapatite as well as the barium sulfate okay you can see here I and mean, the maximum concentration of 10 weight percentage we have mixed it and uh, as that uh, that another major important study is the shape memory characteristics of that proposed material 
okay so we need to ensure that this has a from that uh, we have studied this uh, shape memory study using a dma technique okay there is some standard operating protocol okay so that we need to heat the sample up to 10 de 70 degree at a 10 degree per minute then we need to this is a temperature graph you can see here and you have to keep it at isothermal condition of 70 degree then there you have to apply the load of 4 newton load and you have to keep it at the temperature and after that you have to cool down to minus 30 degree okay this is standard uh, protocol what was suggested okay to test that uh, shape memory characteristics of that uh, polymer in a dma so up to minus 30 okay so the thing is that uh, earlier we could not able to do because minus 30 was not achievable you know otherwise because we need to have that uh, low, low temperature environment also then only we can do that uh, dma okay otherwise generally normal dma will be having only the high temperature attachment only the low temperature attachment is not was not there so recently uh, we have got one uh, low temperature att attachment also with uh, Anten for, anten for DMA multi drive system we have procured it okay and that we have that attachment for cryogenic temperature also we can able to use a liquid nitrogen and we can able to do that study okay and this is the procedure what is the way it is the isothermal condition for a 5 minutes then after that you can release the tensile force of 0.1 newton then this is a standard protocol of how it is supposed to be done and all like that okay and the shape fixity and the shape recovery you can able to calculate and this is that a protocol what is supposed to be followed and this is what the test results of our pure shape memory polarity okay you can see here this is what the temperature trend uh, yes. uh, professor kanagraj yes sorry to interrupt you uh, sir how much more time you have sir so how much time will be there you just tell me sir because next speaker is waiting oh okay, sir. Fine. So you can you can finish and wind up in five five minutes, sir. Okay. That's fine. Okay. This is what the shape memory, and from here you can be able to get the uh, uh, shape recovery and uh, uh, shape fixity also. And this is something like we have studied about how long it can be able to stable and all like that during the processing and all. And uh, once you are as you adding the rain for uh, what you can say porogens whether any porogens is left or not that we can able to see from the thermogrammetric study also okay and uh, after that we have studied about that uh, pores whether we are after removing the porogens how it will be looking like and all like that okay so that when it is a blood is with this sample when it is used how that there is a possibility of a blood flow into that system so that it can able to have a blockage and all like that that's what we have studied it okay however uh, this one uh, we have prepared the material and this one now we are working on that uh, in vitro model so we will be developing that aneurysm and all like that and that uh, the blood flow will be and in this pipe this is all 3d printed compound okay so we will be using it and we will get that aneurysm and we will be seeing how we can able to here we will be mixing the dye so that we can able to see how that flow pattern and all like that and we are doing some analysis also okay so that how the flow pattern and all that is what in connection with the 3d printing for the treatment of aneurysm we are in that working condition okay and uh, as he has given five minutes so i will give uh, just a few overview about what we have been doing and all. this is what our 3d printing facility what we are going to what is uh, ordered so maybe within a month we will be having it in our uh, uh center for biological science and healthcare engineering center at iit guwahati we have a uh, fdm sla for polymer based and that polymer based 3D printing. Okay, yes, uh, selective laser sintering process also. And that Stabler cup, we are working on it for the total heap replacement and for the, all the starting items and all like that, mold and all like that, we have used it. This is mainly uh, using 3D printing technique. And uh, mostly, what you can say, uh, we have using this, this is we are going to use as a implant for a total heap replacement, not this uh, Stabler cup as, 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 as per the required size. If it is the case, we need to test it as per that uh, in vivo condition. Okay, that is what we have developed a hip joint wear simulator that can be used. Uh, was developed as per the ISO standard 14242, so that you can able to use that. Uh, this is can work as per that flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, and internal external rotation along with the dynamic loading as per the ISO 14421. Okay, so we can able to test it. And uh, then another one we are working on that knee joint. 
okay this is a third generation knee joint what we are working in it this for the transfemoral amputee this for testing on it this for the first version we have tested it for around 12 patients more than that and we got a feedback based on that uh, we have designed a second gen this is what the uh, second gen first generation second generation third generation this is a first generation patient trial this is second generation patient trial here also you can see here around nine people and this one now uh, beauty is that bilateral amputee also we have tested it okay and this is a third generation and that advantage is that this one can have a, a knee flexion up to 120 he can able to sit and this one he can have a knee uh, deep flexion he can able to bend his knee up to 135 degree so that he can able to use the indian toilet and in the third one this is a right now it is a, we have manufactured it in waiting for a patient trial this one we have added a three more features here the tk alignment and that uh, knee rotating option and that uh, changing that as the system is working on four bar mechanism we have uh, given provision for adjusting the vertical link and the horizontal link mechanism okay and in addition we are also working on that uh, ankle foot okay dynamic ankle foot whenever the person is earlier we have during patient trial they are using a uh, sack foot only now we have designed uh, what you can say uh, dynamic foot so that when he, the person is walking in an uneven surface also he can able to walk without losing its balance okay then the socket silicon liner and shuttle lock so that we can able to ensure that they will not use any socket layer so that uh, the patient comfortability and uh, can be improved this for our uh, afo we have designed it and it was tested also he has been using it and we have developed uh, maybe last few slides and we have developed about that uh, gait and motion analysis lab and we have eight ir cameras and uh, two video cameras and uh, two force plates crystal force plate uh, and we have emg sensor foot map pressure mapping unit and all so we have they established a full fledged gate lab so that whatever assisted devices or medical devices are being used and uh, we can able to quantitatively we can able to say how the patient is uh, improving well this is what the knee brace okay for that uh, if uh, knee, oste knee osteoarthritis we are, we are working on it and this is for rgo okay this was the assisted device this is our research group and this acknowledgement to my phd student project staff and other collaborators and funding agency with that i would like to thank you. fine to all Hope thank you so much you. professor kanikraj for such a nice talk now we have questions for you sir so one question is that uh, how do you tackle filler clogging problem in nozzle with composite elements sorry there is a question in the chat box is there sir how do you tackle filler clogging problem in nozzle with composite filaments yeah in that 3d printing na so we, uh, that all the particles are in the nano size okay so in everything we have we have ensured that they they are not have uh, they are not uh, uh, agglomerated they are homogeneously dispersed in that okay so and after that only we uh, we have made the form of in the form of wire in a tin screw extruder and that wire was used in a uh, 3d printer okay this is that uh, what you can say that 3d printer what you use is about 30000 only okay we are not gone for that high end one okay we have played with all the things and we have set all the parameter in such a way that we can able to do that yes and we have used once again i am saying that this once again we are used we have used only that nano particle nano hydrosubtype and that uh, nano barium sulfate we have synthesized it and we have used it okay. and they have been so, properly so that there is no agglomeration in he is asking you uh, reference to hap filler and tungsten filler the yeah, tungsten also it is a, from the sigma average okay so that is a, depending on the raw material what you are going to use what is the size of the raw material then only there is a chances of we can able to avoid the agglomerations when you are injecting it hope i have answered it thank you so much for your nice presentation and apologies for little time constraint Okay. because we are having the validity at 12 15 12 20 okay. so we have to finish all the speaker talk before that okay. so thank you so much for sharing all your expertise and knowledge
and as i know you you are working so for so many years in iit guwahati and very near to us and we uh, have been collaborating with you yeah yeah respects from my department also so thank you so much professor and thank, thank you, you thank sir you. thank you for your nice talk sir thank you okay. so much Now we need to have the last speaker of our session, Dr. Mamita Mukherjee. Dr. Mamita Mukherjee is alumni of Presidency College and Kolkata University. She received Embassy Physics degree with specialization in Electronics and Communication and Tech. Dr. Mukherjee is honorary Biomedical Engineering and Technical Ambassador of SUMBI USA. She is the adjunct professor and members of Board of Studies of the Joint Academic Program. on biomedical instrumentation conducted by kolkata university and the west bengal university of health science dr mukherjee is former senior scientist the rdo center of excellence under ministry of defense government of india joined at the mas university in 2015 and working as associate dean and academic coordinator of school of science dr mamita has guided more than 20 master thesis under kolkata university West Bengal University of Health Science and West Bengal University of Technology (WBUT) and supervising three PhD theses under WBUT and at the Mas University. Her research interest is focused on tehas electronic semiconductor device based and medical electronics instrument. She has published more than 150 peer review international peer review journals and editorial board members of international journals. She has delivered a number of invited talks and presented several research articles in IEEE international conference and acted in various capacities such as technical chairs, organizer, organizing secretary and convener in IEEE and DST international conference in India and abroad. Now I will come to Dr. Mukherjee Ma'am to the platform to present her speech on the topic relevance of 3D printing in medical applications. Thank you, Madam. Am I audible? Uh, yes, Ma'am, you are audible. Audible. Very good morning, Dr. Mumita. Very good Very morning, sir. Uh, uh, confirm that whether you can see my screen. Yes, we can hear you and we can uh, see your screen also. Presentation also. Okay. Thank you. You can just put it so, in the slide mo uh, slide show mode, ma'am. Uh, sure. Yeah. So thank yeah. you very much for this nice uh, introduction. Now today my talk will cover uh, will be covered in two parts. First part will be on the terahertz sensor and antenna development, and the second part will be on its 3D printing implication for application in biomedical application. so we are actually we have done this work in collaboration of the defense research and development organization a uh, couple of years back and some of the uh, observations and results from there i will uh, be happy to share with you so uh, the talk will covered in this contents for the introduction design development 3d printing then terahertz characterization of that sensor and antenna and after that the advantage and disadvantage of that now why we are interested in terahertz region because terahertz region all of you know it spans in between 100 gigahertz and 10 terahertz and it has potential application possibilities in the field of scientific commercial and development uh, government areas especially in the from the medical point of view early detection of cancer then uh, from pharmaceutical uh, point of view pill inspection then uh, the bone density determination detection of tooth decay so these are some of the application from medical sector from government and homeland security sector why defense is uh, particularly concentrating on this zone because of its concealed weapon identification detection of suicide bomber and uh, passenger screening all this so from starting from astrophysics to plasma dyno diagnostics to biochemistry everywhere it has immense application possibilities but in spite of its even uh, good application possibilities in various domain uh, the application is still very limited why because of the non availability of room temperature uh, small size terahertz sources 
most of the terahertz sources those are available in nature or uh, in market are bulky in complex and uh, though we know something about quantum cascade laser nowadays but it has advantage of small size but it requires the cooling arrangement because it cannot be operated at room temperature and that is the severe limitation of its application for biomedical sector so if we want to develop some devices some sensor and antenna coupled with the sensor then uh, we have to concentrate on two uh, factors one is the highest application uh, uh, optimum frequency part another is that at high optimum frequency we will be able to get the power maximum that means some power is required so that we can do the imaging we can do the uh, inspection that uh, part that i have covered in last slide now in particularly from biomedical application point of view it is important because we know uh, with the biomedical engineer all of we know that uh, x ray is ionizing radiation and it causes uh, damage if we use again and again then it can causes damage to the cell so if we can replace it by a suitable terrarray source and detectant system then it will be very much advantageous for the uh, mankind so we have started and done some work to, uh, in this direction now 3d printing and terahertz sensor how they are coupled this is all of we know already in couple of days uh, for in two three days in this fdp and also my last honorable speaker they have covered many uh, dimension of this 3d printing technology for the development of various devices so all of you by this time know that it is uh, efficient material utilization from raw materials that are not sintered or shaped can be used it can be used repeatedly so lower energy consumption then less uh, demanding on the operator's experience that means uh, lower labor cost so high flexibility is there so uh, and short turn around time it eliminates the tool and the mold preparation time hence processing cycle becomes shorter so there are several advantages for which uh, we can think for uh, this 3d printing technology for the development of terahertz and millimeter wave antenna and sensing systems and that is why we have adopted that in laboratory so but uh, all of we know that before going for the laboratory we need some mathematical uh, modeling uh, that which is called the design part now in the design we have to choose a material perfectly as my last speaker also emphasized on the nanomaterial application in our case also we have uh, developed this device which is called super lattice nano uh, dimensional device and for this device what would be the material that can be used for biomedical purpose so we have done a lot of study on that and after that uh, we have developed the device based on the silicon carbide technology so silicon carbide technology the major reason behind it is is it's the maximum power capable uh, capability that at, even at high terahertz region silicon carbide is capable of generating 500 times more power than the conventional silicon technology so we have adopted that semiconductor and in our uh, analysis in our uh, design we have incorporated the effect of other factors those can create some uh, impact on the development in the fabrication that is purely a parasitic series resistance effects and thermal issues are there choice of substrate is very important for the development then as i told you that realistic model definitely is required before doing any fabrication and the structure optimization so the device that we have actually uh, developed through this uh, nano dimensional super lattice form is actually uh, that involves two types of uh, physics inside it one is the transit time, one is the avalanche build up another is the transit time effect so the uh, charge carrier that will actually flow from the uh, cathode to anode part and it will uh, take some time for flow and that uh, velocity with with a carrier saturation velocity the charge carrier will flow through this drip region and in the outer uh, circuit we will get some radiation some power and that power will be eliminated by the antenna 3d antenna and this way the device this is the schematic diagram or structure of this device uh, we can do that in single drift mode or we can do that in uh, double drift mode both are allowed 
based upon your uh, requirement of power we have to choose whether the sensor and antenna system will be double drift or the single drift region device so low high low is what low high low means uh, in order to uh, reduce the parasitic series series resistance and to increase the power output and efficiency in the output what we can do we can incorporate or introduce charge bomb selectively inside the drift region of the device and as a result what will happen the avalanche zone region will get constricted and the drift region will be higher and in the output we will get much power uh, from these devices but in our particular cases uh, in the, the the fabrication that i will actually share with you uh, we have developed the first set because it is comparatively low cost and that is why we have chosen the first one for our development of 3d uh, antenna and sensing system for terahertz region so this the uh, same idea can also be adopted for double drift region in case of single drift region what we have done we have incorporated a charge bump inside the drift region of the n side or t side as far as our requirement is concerned now in case of double drift since there are two types of drifting one is n type means the electron will flow there and that is the p type hole will flow there so we will uh, select the charge bump accordingly as per our design when the design will be covered then the original fabrication steps will start and since it is a nano device the antenna the terahertz antenna that uh, the device will be embedded within the antenna system and that fabrication needs some uh, control uh, particularly uh, for getting low series resistance and high power so some uh, double iterative dc mechanism has been uh, ad ad adopted for doing this uh, design and the breakdown voltage and a predictable efficiency these are some of the mathematical background that we have developed in our own laboratory but we i i, I am not uh, going into it because of the time constraint now these are some of the output results that we have obtained that is the variation of electric field within the drift region and we have actually adopted the harmonic power oscillation technology and when the device will be developed and that will be inside the embedded antenna system and uh, there will be a tuner and using that tuner if you tune it from 0.3 terahertz and you can get power output up to 1.8 terahertz so almost a 2 terahertz device can be developed and the size will be almost a nano dimension but you will get milliwatt level of power and if you can uh, I, I will show you how we have done that if we can uh, make a matrix of it that means 3 3 by 3 or 5 by 5 matrix of the devices the power will be added and effectively some watt level power can be generated and that can be used for useful application in biomedical as well as defense sector so particularly we have done that for defense sector but we can also use it parallelly for the biomedical imaging now these are the some of the output results that we have obtained now from the uh, fabrication point of view we have uh, purchased the apoafr after the design from key international in Dar darham usa and in plus plus substrate we have chosen the background of its choosing is that because in case of electron the mobility will be higher for silicon carbide and when the mobility will be higher it is expected that the parasitic resistance will be lower so that is why instead of p plus plus yeah, substrate which is also sorry which is also not uh, which is also not much available in uh, market we have uh, taken uh, the started the process with the n plus plus substrate and then in type doping actually done and this was uh, already published uh, in uh, referred journal earlier the mechanism how the growth process was carried out and after that the growth of p plus plus layer because you know i have already shown you the diagram the substrate n plus plus and above this one n layer will be there and then one p layer and then one the cap layer which is called p plus plus layer so this layer formation the p plus plus for hsic layer that was grown on top of the film by aluminium ion implantation technique and then the doping concentration we have chosen uh, of the order of 10 to the power 19 per centimeter cube because uh, this is the optimization the temperature the doping the time it has been optimized by several run 
and then the post implantation annealing that was performed at 1600 degree centigrade and for 45 minutes in argon atmosphere now the formation of the resistive p plus uh, p and n contact is it, this is also very vital because all of we know that when we are going for the development of high power devices then the loss of power at the uh, semiconductor metallic contact should be low so what we have done we have adopted the pirana uh, solution technique then the di water and sample was dipped in di dilute hydrochloric acid for 30 seconds we have done that and after that dried it and immediately after the cleaning sio2 layer on p plus plus side was grown by plasma enhanced pcvt technique and the temperature that was optimized with uh, 285 degrees centigrade now the oxide layer from the p plus side later removed and that was removed by the technique which is called buffer oxide edge technique and through the lithography we have adopted the photolithography because of the dimension of the device the dimension is uh, not much higher i have uh, told you that it is of the order of nanoscale and super lattice stru structures are there so that fine structures and also the metallic contacts are almost of the order of 10 uh, nanometer to 15 nanometer so you can uh, imagine that total device will not exceed one micron size so that is why the lithography process we have not adopted for ebeam lithography but we have uh, sorry we have adopted for ebeam lithography instead of the photo, photo photolithography and then the contact metal that was chosen aluminium titanium aluminium that is the layering order uh, in form of a uh, metal alloy to, uh, the purpose is always is to uh, reduce the contact uh, contact uh, resistance and then the sample was annealed for three minutes in rapid thermal anneal uh, furnace in nitrogen atmosphere for 950 degrees centigrade and then reduces the contact resistance significantly after that the n plus uh, type contact that is the lower contact was formed at this 200 nanometer thickness we have found we have developed and then rta treatment done for three minutes at 950 degrees centigrade then the choice of metallic composition that was based on the formation of nit si alloy the higher the concentration as i told you the lower will be the specific contact resistance so all time the idea that that actually played in our mind is to reduce the specific contact resistance of the uh, p type that is cathode and anode formation for uh, integrating it with some device now four point probe technique that was usually used to measure all of we know for the layer and uh, shallow layer uh, epitaxial and the bulk resistivity of the bare wave wafer. So in our case also, we have done that. And as I discussed with you, the layer thickness, you can see that 300 micron, then 0.4 micron, then 0.4 and 0.4. So these are the specific output from the fabrication uh, that we have obtained after uh, characterization. So these are the fabrication. Some edge time was varied from 0 to 600 second. Edge depth was measured with the four probe and resistivity particularly was measured for different types of layer. And top side resistivity, final resistivity that was obtained 3.2 and for the uh, layer type was P plus and for back side that is N plus, we obtained the resistivity 6.4 milli ohm centimeter and till that it is the lowest reported resistivity obtained from this type of fabrication. Now, the experimental observation that the four probe and hall measurement we have done and again the edge time was varied from uh, 0 to 540 second. Estimated depth was analyzed and then resistivity was varied in between and accordingly we have optimized the uh, structure doping and the time of etching. So PN junction finally was formed by growing silicon carbide on silicon RTCVD system that was adapted in defense lab. And uh, the results we obtained was look like this. And after that, the wafer cleaning that I'm not going in much details of it because uh, I have already covered that, that uh, several process steps were there. Otherwise, contamination effect should be there and some shorting after uh, development of the device it may happen that from a particular four inch wafer we can uh, make thousands of such diodes or devices sources and, uh, and antenna coupled but when we will go for the terahertz characterization through vector network analyzer we found that some of the devices those are not most of the devices in fact those who are not operating why because of the starting uh, problem 
uh, we, if we do not make the cleaning properly, then there always be a chance of um, uh, diamond dust, some dust materials remains there and it creates the short. So short circuit effect happens. So that is why we have to take care of it. And then piranha cleaning, that is the solution ratio. One is to one, 96 percent sulfuric acid and 30 percent H2O2. They boiled at 80 degrees centigrade for a very small amount, uh, for a small time span. And after that, the DI water for few minutes, and then we can get the uh, poly, uh, the totally uh, contaminant free surface with, on which the layer can be deposited through the RTCPD technique. Now, the technology that we have incorporated in our design, as I told you, that it is a, a factor of, it's a matter of nano device uh, formation and also another term I used that is the uh, super lattice. So when we are forming this super lattice, that means one lattice and several lattice, one after one will be uh, fabricated, will be developed gradually one after one. So silicon will be the starting one, one zero zero, and after that three CSIC. But if we do that directly, then sometimes due to the lattice mismatch, some crack appears. We have started that surface study and we have found some cracks. So we have uh, incorporated germanium very judicially inside these two layers. And when we have incorporated that, the surface roughness was reduced significantly. That was that took uh, say two to three months to optimize the dose, how much germanium will be incorporated there and how will you reduce the uh, surface roughness. So then I can show you the roughness analysis result. And this roughness analysis was reduced significantly when we have incorporated the germanium there. So if you can compare, you will find the some image statistics are shared here. So if we can uh, compare, you will see that how the surface roughness was reduced significantly because all of you know that when the surface will be rough, that portion will work as a uh, recombination center for electron and hole. And as a result, what will happen? The effective output power from the radiation antenna that will be reduced. So we have to take care. We have to be very cautious at this level for the uh, design after the 3D design when we are going through the uh, in, in the fabrication. This is very important step. And then comes the uh, normal that uh, procedure that is called RIE, reactive ion etching technique, and silicon carbon bonds that show high chemical inertness. Hence, wet teaching is not efficient for reaching the deep trenches. And the more appropriate dye plasma etching, reactive ion etching that is used for separating diode mesa. So as I told you, when we have chosen that four inch wafer and process that, through the several process steps as discussed, then what will happen from the four inch wafer, uh, we can get almost thousand number of MESA diodes, MESA sources. So that all the sources that are actually embedded in the terahertz waveguide, because since it is the total dimension is of the order of micron, then uh, it cannot be fabricated separately. If it is uh, of the order, if, if, if it is for using for the microwave, that means low frequency region, what we have done in our earlier experiment, we have developed device separately and the antenna system separately and couple that in for, to form a uh, useful device. But in this case, uh, the technology that we have adopted, it's the super lattice technology and the device will be an embedded part of the terahertz waveguide. So within the waveguide, layer by layer growth, as I shown you just now, has been done. Now titanium nickel bilayer metal evaporated on the sample. The metallic bilayer that used as RIE mask and covers area that will form the MESA diode. Now dry etching was after that performed and plasma thumb 719 reactor that was used and RIE reactor with a plasma that is composed of SF6 and oxygen gases, uh, source generated at 13.56 uh, megahertz uh, operating at a maximum power of 300 watts. So these are the observation from the uh, typical laboratory system. And after that, we measured that. Then after measuring this type of observation, I am sharing with you that the fabricated TDA sources for different MESA, we have done the experiment that is 40 micron, then 20 micron, and then 30 micron contact. Actually, the center one is the device, and that is embedded in the outer circle. That means the uh, radiating antenna. 
we we have used the horn antenna for its uh, embedding that means the device will be attached with the horn antenna system and then from the antenna the radiation will come out actually in the output and you can use it for any sort of application uh, but for that we have to um, be very careful about the distance that means uh, for say for distance x the power layer uh, requirement is p1 then that will actually vary if the distance varies so accordingly your fabrication uh, procedures the design will vary now this, these are all the aged profile we obtained after the experiment that is 20 30 and 40 micron mesodiodes and uh, then the bright field mask for beam lit pattern actually in this uh, technology in this case we have adopted the beam lit system and the device were actually look like this and the after alignment the photoresist that was exposed to uv light for 30 seconds and 90 seconds for low and high viscous pr respectively pr uh, photoresistive uh, and then the chemically it alters resist changes solubility in defined areas so area we have defined and accordingly the photoresist are chosen ashing was done so these are the common process step for fabrication of any such devices and antenna for with 3d printing technology and after that the front side and beam lit side of the individual diode chip was look like this after completion of all the experimental procedure finally it will look like a star uh, because we have adopted the beam lit structure design and these are the ip characteristics that we have measured using the uh, terahertz vector network analyzer and you can see that we have got uh, we have obtained the iv uh, that is the breakdown breakdown uh, mechanism uh, breakdown for current and voltage though the breakdown is not much sharp that is why the work is already going on and to make it more sharper because when it will be more sharp then the power output will be more high okay so the work is already going on and particular concentration is on the reduction of surface leakage current if the surface leakage current is higher this type of soft breakdown will occur so optimization work is going on uh, till now now, as I told you that work, what, what are the work? Those are going on PCVT technique and junction passivation that we have done. That work we are doing uh, more uh, cautiously to reduce, uh, to make the breakdown sharper. So these are some of the technology that has been adopted to make the junction passivation. And finally, this terahertz device that was fabricated, it was actually fabricated. We are uh, thankful to INX and uh, the Newcastle University and a part of the defense project. It was done a few years back and they are bridge that was used to contact because as I told you that it is extremely small dimensional device. And for that fabrication, we need some special arrangement. And that was the arrangement that I can show you here. And this device, particularly silicon germanium and silicon carbide heterostructure devices, or you can say super lattice devices, that was actually developed. Now, these are the terahertz circuitry. These are the board that we developed and uh, put the device there for the measurement technique. Now, this is uh, some of the portion that you have already listened in last two, three days, and also on my previous honorable speaker, they have covered it very elaborately that why should we, why we have gone for 3D printing technology, why it is used. So uh, in brief, this is the process of joining materials to make objects from 3D model data, usually layer upon layer, and as opposed to substrative uh, manufacturing methodology. So if we start from the digital to physical, then it is the 2D printing. And now when we are going to 3D printing digital to physical, so it will look like this. So some of the observations that already my previous speaker has already covered, these are the mechanism with which the um, device actually uh, developed in laboratory. And uh, I am not going much in details in that because these are already covered and you have gone through it. So powder based system, some of the systems, these are available for doing this fabrication in lab we have used the electron beam melting medical uh, application metal parts are there so uh, in uh, if we go through the market portion uh, though we have developed our device particularly as i shared with you uh, keeping in mind the application 
uh, from defense point of view and later from biomedical imaging point of view as well. But if we go for market overview, then manufacturing is already billion of 2.2 uh, industry worldwide. So it has huge uh, importance and huge, uh, it's an emerging field. So uh, we can do that uh, more seriously in coming days. We can continue it. It is a very rich area of research. Then uh, how do people use the 3D printing? Uh, the prototyping, low volume uh, manufacturing for tooling, consumer products, as I told you, then customization, personalization, art design for education purpose as well for medical purpose. And we have also adopted that for medical as well as for the uh, imaging purpose, means the battlefield imaging or some sensor and antenna system development using 3D technology. Then the prototyping. So low barrier to create a physical model is limited risk if it fails. So people get uh, shows interest and particularly when there is a uh, problem of funding. Then they get products into the customer's hand, streamline development process. It save money and time and then ability to iterate and incorporate new feedback. So design anything you, you, you can do. And particularly since my field of research is uh, micro millimeter wave and terahertz sensor and antenna. So in our laboratory, we have used that for that purpose, not particularly for direct uh, the uh, um, development of medical devices, but indirectly those sources can be used for development of any sort of medical devices. And then the because it has immense application in imaging fields, that is why I am telling. Then the challenges, there are some obvious challenges are there. There is limited and high cost of materials unreal reliability of machines 20 percent rejection rate still now and then challenges to scaling up technology speed environmental concern surface finish resolution mechanical properties so these are some of the challenges every technology has its own, own challenges but still i must say that it is far more better compared to others so terahertz and 3d printing how they have uh, actually um, because earlier in any you, you will find millimeter wave antenna applications, people have already used 3D, but in case of terahertz, uh, probably it is a very new results and that is why we have published in IEEE uh, transactions. And most of the applications are seen as a fabrication of devices like sensor, waveguide, horn antenna and cavity based components. So in our case also, we have developed sensor and waveguide coupling. The 3D printing uses powder or liquid. I have already shared this and then different from Traditional substractive manufacturing process, 3D printing is an additive manufacturing process, and that is actually environmental friendly, low cost, low power consuming, and highly flexible and has a short processing cycle. So these are some of the pictures that I can show you after the antenna was designed and the characterization was done. And this is actually something that I told you after design, uh, what we obtained is uh, after fabrication, that is actually the uh, printing, 3D printing uh, layer of the antenna system and it is a uh, array type because from a single device we can get 3 or uh, maybe 15 milliwatt max, max to max, 15 milliwatt of power but if we can make a 4 by 4 matrix system then the power output will be quite higher. So considering that uh, this type of array arrangement has, was done for generating or getting more power from it. So thank you with this, I'm concluding. Now, if any question, please share. Thank you so much, Dr. Momita, for such nice talk. And there are a few questions for you. One question is, how is agglomeration prevented? Uh, how is? Agglomeration Sorry. prevented. Oh, the, actually that was prevented as I told you that uh, when we, we are taking care of this uh, parasitic effects, that means when the carrier actually passing through the drip region and the substrate and the uh, cross layer, junctions layer create a uh, problem. And uh, at that layer, maximum absorption of carriers happens. So we have taken care by PZVD technique and as well as by junction passivation. So in this way, the passivation technique was actually uh, adopted and uh, made as much as possible, fine possible. 
नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन इज वॉट आर द थर्मल इश्यूज इन सिलीकॉन कार्बाइड टेक्नोलॉजी thermal issues that we have faced particularly uh, it's a good question in case of silicon carbide all of you know the therm uh, thermal uh, conductivity value is quite higher but particularly in this fabrication since it is a micron and nan nano level fabrication we are doing uh, the end pushing a large amount of current say of the order of 1 into 10 to the power 8 ampere per meter square and the area is very small the device area micron order so you can imagine that uh, current per area that means current density will be quite higher though silicon carbide is a very good material for as far as thermal conductivity is concerned and we have adopted uh, the diamond heat sink system for radiation of this uh, extra heat energy uh, still uh, some time we faced uh, problem that is the burnout issues in the earlier uh, time we have faced that initial problem was very much there and thereafter we have designed a proper diamond heat sink to incorporate the total system that means device embedded in the terahertz wave guide totally in the diamond and when we have incorporated diamond you know it has excellent thermal conductivity i we we actually overcome the problem So okay, thank you so much ma'am. Uh, I would like to thanks all the organizer for three leading universities RGU and CKUH and NIHU for conducting this successful one week course. All the participants and experts for sharing their valuable time with us. Before we conclude with this one week short term course program we will have a validatory session by a welcome address from Mr Susan Kar Bora or the organizer Mr Susan Kar is an IT professional with almost 21 years of experience in companies like British Telecom HCL Technologies extra he has a physics background and has done his master in information system and close up supply chain from maastricht school of management the netherlands he is an active electronics and ham radio enthusiast currently he, he leads the it team for royal global university and is a key member of iic till now under his leadership seven different startups have come up in the university i invite you sir to give the welcome address on a one week online international short term course on recent advance of 3d printing and its biomedical engineering applications sir please unmute yourself Are you able to hear me now? Yes. Yes. Oh, sorry, the my microphone got switched over. Uh, my, well, I'm the first speaker for the well directory session. Uh, I welcome you all again, once again. Uh, special thanks go to Dr. Uh, Chao Ting Mo from uh, Taiwan and all the other participants from Taiwan. We uh, see Nehu, uh, our vice chancellor. Uh, Dr. S. P. Singh and Professor A. Mishra from Negrims, uh, and especially to Mr. Uh, M. L. Jain also from Indore. Uh, other th uh, other than them, uh, special thanks goes to all the eminent speakers from IITs, IIM, uh, sorry, AIMS, uh, Altem Technology, Design Tech, PSIR, Chandigarh, uh, Adams University, and Nehu. Uh, I sincerely thank you all for such a uh, brilliant session over the days, and I have learned quite a lot. And in fact, we have got uh, um, so much to uh, you know new exposure, and we have learned quite a lot. And I thank you all. And uh, and well, last but not the least, I should thank uh, Hero, Dr. Hero Kumaranjan Das, and Dr. Bhatia, Dinesh Bhatia, for this for organizing such a brilliant, brilliant event. Uh, thank you all. That'll be all from me. Okay. Thank you.
Thank you, sir. Now I would like to have the next speech by Dr. Sing Mao Chu, MD, Vice Director, NCKUH Taiwan. Dr. Mao did his degree from the College of Medicine, National Chiangkong University from 2000 to 2006. Presently, he is working as Vice Director in the National Medical Center, National Chiangkong University Hospital, 2020 till date. He is also associated as Project Staff, Medical Device Innovation Center, National Chiangkong University, 2019 to date. Adjunct Attending Physicians Department of Plastic Surgery, Ida Cancer Hospital 2019 to date and consultant Kong Thai Metal Industrial Corporation Limited 2017 to date. He also the general manager Health Way Biomedical Corporation Limited 2019 to date. He has was leadership and management experience with several publications in reputed journals. Now I invite you, sir, to give the speech on the one week international short term course on recent advance of 3D printing and its biomedical engineering applications. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, so, uh, uh, dear Professor Jane, uh, Dr. Bhatia, and uh, all excellencies online with us. Uh, so we have reached the end of this uh, five day course. And it is my task to provide some closing remarks. It is a sad task because we are just about to close such wonderful and uh, fruitful course, as well as bidding farewell to each other. However, it is also a privilege and an honor to be entrusted with such an undertaking at a gathering of so many eminent people from India and Taiwan. Uh, uh, in the fields of additive manufacturing and uh, bioengineering. So uh, in the past five days, we have learned that the growing body of research on additive manufacturing reveals its great potential in medical application. Additive manufacturing is becoming a widely accepted technique in medicine as it offers uh, patient-specific design, high complexity and on demand and cost-effective fabrication, and also high productivity. Uh, drugs designed using uh, additive manufacturing have control of genetics and achieve good efficacy. Uh, medical implants, such as, uh, 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 sorry, uh, medical, medical implants, such as, uh, uh, total hip joints or knee joints created by additive manufacturing can also improve the safety and accuracy of treatment. And through this adv advanced technology, preoperative models can help us surgeons to plan surgeries and the general surgical tools can uh, help to solve certain surgical problems and shorten the operation time. Also, processes and orthosis provide patients with personalized devices to recover certain functions and improve their quality of life. And uh, uh, I think both India and Taiwan have uh, excellent infrastructure and research resources for the development, development of additive manufacturing applications in medical industry. So I deeply believe that uh, such an opportunity like this short-term course of sharing research results and experience between experts from both countries can yield some inspiring innovations and research topics in the future. And I also hope there will be more and more opportunities like this one. And us, uh, National Chen Kong University, absolutely will also devote to these related activities uh, and hopefully you can contribute as much as we can. Uh, I think that is the vision which uh, we are working and will be working on. So thank you. It uh, has been five days of roller coaster. We learned a lot and we'll keep learning. Thank you so much for all your guidance and uh, support. So uh, now I say I have to say goodbye to uh, all our uh, precious guests, and hopefully we can meet each other online soon in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now we'd like to have the 
Next address by Professor B. Babu, University of Hyderabad, Secretary SMCI. Professor P. Babu was the Professor, Department of Biotechnology, University of Hyderabad, from 2006 to date. He is the Reader, Department of Animal Science, University of Hyderabad, Lecturer, Department of Animal Science, University of Hyderabad, and Lecturer, Department of Zoology, SV University, Tirupati. He was the Research Fellow, School of Life Science, University of Hyderabad. He is a Vice President, Society of Neurochemistry India, SNCI, Secretary Asia Pacific Society for Neurochemistry, APSN, Singapore, General Secretary, Society for Neurochemistry India, SNCI, Nagarjuna University. He is the receiver of BP Pandey Memorial Oration Award, Indian Society for Academic of Neurochemistry, Young Scientist Project Awardee, Department of Science and Technology, Biotechnology Overseas, Fellow by uh, Fellow UK DST DAAD Fellow University of <laughs> Germany Boykast Fellow Department of Science and Technology 1998. Now I invite you sir to give away the address of a one week online international short term course on recent advance of 3D printing and its biomedical generic applications. Very good afternoon, all of you. for this uh, valedictory function. Uh, I, I really thank the organizers, uh, especially Professor Dinesh Bhatia, uh, who is uh, instrumental in organizing this. Uh, when he's uh, sometime back approached us that uh, the society, we are uh, running a society, Society for Neurochemistry, uh, in which the uh, uh, Professor Dinesh is the uh, one of the important executive committee members of the society. So I said, uh, it's a wonderful uh, idea that you are organizing this meeting. So I really appreciated uh, Professor Dinesh when he said that he's organizing a uh, recent advances of the 3D printing and its uh, biomedical engineering applications uh, in collaboration with the National Chengkung University Hospital, Taiwan. So it's a very good collaboration that uh, he's uh, really making uh, during this period. Uh, and also other, other collaborator is the Royal Global University, Gauhati. So uh, even during uh, this uh, COVID situation, uh, uh, the Nehu University is able to uh, emphasize the, uh, the how we, we can uh, uh, even expand the scientific their discussions and sharing the knowledge between the uh, different communities and different countries and the different universities. And I see the, there is a large gathering of the participants for the last almost a week. It's a very good, a very, a very good uh, interaction. Uh, what I came to know that uh, many people are participating in this workshop, international workshop, and it's really a pleasure that SNCI, the society, is also part of this. As uh, Professor Dinesh uh, is a, a instrumental uh, in this one, so this workshop uh, not only will give the uh, scientific uh, knowledge, imparting the scientific knowledge. And also, this is providing a, uh, a platform, platform especially for the young scientists, young students, and the scholars to listen to the various experts, especially from the international expert. And as also, the, there are several experts are from uh, AIMS and uh, IITs and different universities. So it's a great opportunity that uh, uh, the Nehu and uh, Professor Dinesh team so they organized it. And we are also happy that uh, we are also the part of this one. So I, I wish all the uh, I congratulate the organizers uh, for having this wonderful uh, workshop, international workshop. So during this this period, so I thank them for uh, making me giving me an opportunity so to say a few words on the behalf of the society. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Now we to have the next address, military address by Professor M. K. Thakur, Banaras Hindu University President, SNCI. Dr. M. K. Thakur is a Professor in Zoology and Coordinator in Interdisciplinary School of Life Science, Banaras Hindu University, India. He has published 135 papers in peer review journals and two books of molecular and cellular neurobiology and brain aging and therapeutic intervention. He has uh, he was awarded that uh, Rockefeller Foundation, MRC and JSPS Fellowship. He was conferred ISA Medal, ICMR Marwa Award and BSU Gold 
Better. He is a former president of IAN and AGI and council members of AIGG, fellow of IAN and ASI member and NAMS, editorial board members, Frontiers and Genetics of Aging, Biogenerology, Current Aging Science, Asian Journals, and Genetics. Now I invite you, sir, to present the military address of a one week online international short term course on recent advance of 3D printing and its biomedical engineering applications. <clears throat> online. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. We can hear you, sir. Uh, seems there's some problem with the video, but anyway, I can start. Uh, you, are I, you, you are audible, sir. All right. <clears throat> so, very good afternoon to all of you. And uh, I take this opportunity to congratulate Dr. Dinesh Bhatia and his team to organize such wonderful program very successfully and thank them for inviting me to be part of the validative function. Society of Neurochemistry India encourages such program and we are happy that one of our active member is the key person to organize this program. It's a pleasure to know that this one day international short term course on recent advancements of 3D printing and its biomedical engineering applications has been jointly organized by the National Cheng Kung University Hospital Taiwan, Northeastern Hill University Ceylon, and Royal Global University Guwahati. It's heartening to note that a large number of participants from all over the country have attended this program and several renowned speakers from different institutions of India and Taiwan have delivered very informative lectures on the recent developments in the area of 3D printing and its applications, in medical and allied areas. Also, many industries working in this field have participated. 3D printing is a frontier area of modern research and has revolutionized the healthcare system. It has been used to produce hearing aids, replacement limbs, surgical implants, and models of organs, bones, and bone cell, uh, blood cells. Thus, this technology has helped to replace human organ transplants, speed up surgical procedures, produce cheaper versions of required surgical tools, and improve the lives of those reliant on prosthetic limbs. So this is a revolution in this field. I believe deliberations and discussion during this five-day course has helped to enrich the knowledge of participants and to establish collaborations between different academic institutions and industries. I wish you all the best. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Now we're going to have the next address by Professor Amilesh Mishra, Nigram Silong. Professor Mishra is among the finest cardiologists in the city. Dr. Amilesh Mishra in Shillong is known for offering excellent patient care. The clinic is located centrally in Shillong GPO, a prominent locality in Shillong. It stands close to Mao Diang Diang Negrims, which not only makes it convenient for people from the vicinity to consult the medical guidance, there is no that of public modes or transport to reach the clinic from all major areas of the city. Dr. Amilish Mishta in Shillong has a well-equipped clinic with all the modern equipments. The clinic has separate waiting and consultation areas which allow enough space for patients to wait conveniently at the clinic. Being a specialized cardiologist, the doctor offers a number of medical services. These include heart, con heart condition, chest pain tra treatment, clinical cardiology, among others. Now I invite you, sir, to give away the address of a one-week online international short-term course on recent instruments of 3D printing and medical engineering applications.
Professor Mishra, are you there, sir? Sir, are you available? Probably he has got disconnected due to network issues. So we'll move to the next, please. Uh, we'll have the next address by Professor Amal J. Dr. Jain received his visiting scholar's position from University of Illinois at Urbanak Champaign UPSA, PhD from Indian City of Technology, Kanpur, in India, MTech from Indian City of Technology, Madras, and BE in Mechanical Engineering from Shri GS Institute Technology and Science, Indore. His research interest is CAD, reverse engineering, modeling, and simulations, biomechanics, and biomodeling. He has published a total of about 35 research papers and presented his research at different international and national platforms. Paris and Urbana Campaign USA is one among of them. Dr. Jane, having more than 28 years of teaching and research experience, Presently, he is a professor at the Department of Mechanical Engineering, Shri GS Institute of Technology and Science in Dhur, Madhya Pradesh. Now, I invite you, sir, to give away the address of a one-week online international short-term course on recent advance of 3D printing and its biomedical engineering applications. A very good afternoon to all of you. I understand that you are listening to me properly. Yes, we can hear you, sir. This uh, one week short term course. This one week short term course on recent advances of 3D printing and its application in biomedical engineering is very successful events uh, of this uh, Royal Global Universities Guwahati jointly organized in collaboration with Taiwan. The overall one week duration have completely give a fruitful solutions to the researcher as well as to the entrepreneurship. For the young participant, I understand who are really interested to go ahead with some their indigenous startups looking to the present scenario of government of India in, in, in a, a lot of flexibilities are there in government area. This particular is by various experts jointly by Taiwan and India of various IITs, AIMS, and some IC uh, laboratories experts. It is very valuable. The one business models which is provided by uh, Taiwan, I think, uh, young entrepreneur. Uh, Dr. Bruce Chen is very energetic and very impressive and very motivating to the young startup people. He forms in 2017 and he shows various different kinds of models and different types of business models and he shows that what is the applications of uh, biomaterials in coming scenario. He also expresses views that the coming times, uh, which is coming uh, in recent uh, future, is custom devices in medical areas where the old standard devices uh, are not successful. Their custom devices will be more impressive and more successful and work very effectively to the patients. So the coming time is uh, is very challenging, and this particular course is. Uh, really being a aid to the young participant, energetic participant and uh, students who are uh, participated in this particular course from various uh, parts of the globe. The Royal Global Universities, the name itself express global uh, universities and they really uh, host this particular events which is a very good platform for the young people's researcher as well as entrepreneurs. I pay my thanks to uh, Professor Dinesh Bhatia of NEHU Shillong for continued busy schedules and giving his very valuable time throughout sessions 
for successful organization of this particular course, Professor S. P. Singh, the VC uh, who provided the various types of supports very happily as he showed during the uh, inauguration sessions. Then Professor A. N. Rai who motivated the team. Then Dr. Ting Mao Chu, the director NCKUA Taiwan who for the collaboration and uh, successfully giving their presentations for motivating the young uh, student and young participant. Then Professor Hira Karanjan Das of Royal Global Universities for planning and organization of these particular events. Thank you very much. And I hardly understand that these events during COVID-19 is really a uh, area and very impactful for the participant and the researchers and the entrepreneurs of these countries as well as Taiwan and whole globe. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Now we'll have the next address by Professor A.K. Bargohan, Royal Global University, Assam. Professor Alak Kumar Bargohan had his early education in Shillong and was among the first batch graduate, first class first in Bethany from Northeastern Hill University, Shillong. He obtained his post graduation from Guwahati University in Bethany first class and PhD from the Imperial College of Science, Technology and Medicines, London in Plant Molecular Biology under the University of London and DIC in Plant Virology, Microbiology from Imperial College of Science, Technology and Medicine. He was the founder head of the Department of Molecular Biology and Biotechnology at the School University, a central university in Assam. Professor Bagahan is also the founder of the ONGC Sponsor Center of Petroleum Biotechnology in the same university. Professor Bogohan has his extensive experience of over four decades in research and teaching. During the last 10 years, Professor Bogohan had a sting in academ academic governance, first as the Registrar of Tespur University and as the Vice Chancellor of Dibrugarh University, Assam, for full term of five years each in both the positions. Professor Bargohan has made remarkable contribution in forging industry, academia interfacing, and in bringing in the international academic research collaboration at the Brugard University under the UKIERRI in Indus US and Indo Tunisian Research Scheme. He was awarded for his remarkable contribution towards experience. Exploratory Industry Academia Partnership by Worldwide Industry Academia Network. Now I invite you, sir, to give over the address of a one-week online international short-term course on recent advance of 3D printing and its biomedical engineering application. Are you there, sir? Professor Alok Bargoen, sir, are you there, sir? Probably, sir. Sir, sir, are you there? Sir, have you joined, sir? Uh, Professor Bargoen, sir, have you joined, sir? Dr. Satya, actually, yes, this sir. is your doctor. Yeah, please tell he me. He will not able to join because of some uh, other problem. He is uh, having some problem with network. OK. Okay. Thank you. So, okay. Now I would like to have the word of thanks by Dr. Dinesh Bhatia, the organizer. Dr. Dinesh Bhatia pursued his PhD in biomechanics and rehabilitation engineering from MNNIT, Allahabad, India, and master degree in biomedical engineering from Mumbai University. He completed his MBA dual specialization in from IMT Ghaziabad. He is currently working as a professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering, Northeastern Hill University, Nehu Shillong, Mekhalaya, India, since August 2013. He was selected for the Young Scientist Award broadcast by, by the Government of India to pursue research in osteoarthritis in, at Biomedical Engineering Department, Florida International University. He was selected as one of the 12 young biomedical scientists by the Indian Council of Medical Research, ICMR Government of India, to pursue research fellowship in the field of sensory, sensory processes at the University of Glasgow, Scotland. 
He has several research papers in reputed journals, conference, seminars, and symposia with teaching and research experience of more than 17 years. He is a panel member of many scientific professional bodies, editorial board members of committees, societies, and forums. Dr. Dinesh worked on several funded projects from the government of India, also the author of six books and 20 book chapters till date with more than 200 plus publications. His areas of interest are medical instrumentation, biomechanics and rehabilitation engineering, medical informatics, signals and imaging processing, marketing, international business and environmental sustainability. I invite you, sir, to give the word of thanks for the international short-term course on a one-week inter online international short-term course on recent advance of 3D printing and its biomedical engineering applications. Thank you for such nice introduction. I am really grateful and thankful to Almighty God that today we have been able to come to the end of this five day event. And we were, uh, have to uh, make a lot of arrangements for getting this event going. And uh, we had a very good team, which I believed helped us in making this event successful and also support from different quarters we received as we started building on this course. You will be glad to know, sir, that there were more than 320 participants who attended or who registered for this course. And many of the uh, participants were uh, still contacting us and we had to actually close the registration link on Tuesday. The workshop started on Monday 12th and on 13th, we had to close the registration link because still registration was going on for this course. Seeing the quality of the speakers and other things. So I asked Dr. Hirak and I requested him that you please close the link for now because uh, we will not be able to handle so many more participants. Maybe we can have them in the next course if we decide to do one. Uh, I'm also thankful that we, we received a lot of queries from different quarters and we also received a lot of appreciation for the course which we were able to do. So I'm very uh, happy and satisfied uh, in uh, conducting this short term international course. I would like to thank first of all uh, NCKHU uh, Vice uh, Director Dr. Ting Mao Chao and uh, Madam Tasai. Who, with whom I was continuously interacting and uh, every day I was interacting uh, for organizing this uh, program uh, from last two to three months. Uh, so I'm very grateful for all the support and all the speakers you have provided for this event. And I hope that we could have such mutual collaborations in near future. I'm also grateful to Dr. Prabhat Chaudhary from All India Institute of Medical Science, Delhi, who was also one of the speakers and who also was instrumental in this collaboration going through. I am really grateful to Professor M.K. Thakurji. Sir, you, thanks for gracing the validatory session and giving your validatory address uh, for this program. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us today. He is also the president of SNCI, and we have one SNCI nominated speaker for this program uh, who delivered his lecture yesterday. I am also uh, grateful and thankful to Professor Prakash Babu from University of Hyderabad, Secretary SNCI who ha has been guiding me and encouraging me to do different uh, aspects. And I'm very grateful to you, sir, for all the encouragement and support you have provided and uh, uh, your enthusiasm for, uh, for encouraging me to take over this course. So I'm very, very uh, grateful. Once I inform you that, sir, we are doing this short term course and you said that uh, please go ahead and my full support will be there to you for organizing this event. So I'm very grateful to you. Whenever I have spoken to you or uh, talking, uh, chatted with you on WhatsApp, I feel uh, quite enthusiastic and motivated. So thank you, sir, for keeping my spirits up. I'm also grateful to uh, Dr. and Professor Animesh Mishra, sir from Nigrim Shillong. He is one of the finest cardiologists in the city. Uh, unfortunately, due to network issues, he has not been able to join. He even called me that there is some network connectivity issues in his institute, so he's not able to join the link. So I am very grateful uh, to him also. I'm also thankful to the uh, Vice Chancellor of Royal Global, Professor S.P. Singh, and our former Vice Chancellor, Professor A.N. Rai, who had graced the inaugural session 
and Professor Alok Bhargwan also from Royal Global who had graced the inaugural session and shared their views with the participants. Last, I am also thankful to uh, Dr. Hirak Ranjan Das who has helped me in organizing this event and continuously we were having discussions that how we are going to arrange and try to have the things planned out so that it goes off smoothly and it is coordinated. So I am very happy and grateful to him and you would be glad to know that we also got a call uh, last two days back from some people from South India and also from Gujarat, Gandhinagar that they are also interested to organize one uh, such event and they were very happy with the, the course content and the speakers which we had taken for this course. So they uh, called us and they wanted to uh, discuss regarding this. So if uh, something of that sort materialized, we will definitely bring it to notice of all of you. And I'm also thankful to the IT team, uh, which is under Sasanka Borua uh, and also Jay Sharma, one of the students who has been coordinating from the last five days and sending you the feedback links and all other details. So in the WhatsApp group as well as in email. So I'm very thankful and grateful to Jay and all your other student colleagues who are taking care of this aspect so that we don't face any issues and we can concentrate on organizing this program. I'm also thankful to all the speakers from IITs, NITs, Central Universities, All India Institute of Medical Sciences from Taiwan and other places. I'm very, very uh, thankful and grateful to all of you for sharing your knowledge and giving us the time to speak uh, with and share your knowledge with the participants. I'm really grateful to all of you. I'm also thankful to all the participants for your patience and many of the participants asked several queries. We tried to put those queries to the speakers. I hope you have been satisfied with those answers and uh, I apologize if there have been any technical glitches or some kind of network issues which are beyond our control but I hope overall you must have been satisfied and we would be sharing with you the feedback and other form after you fill it you will be receiving your certificate. So I am really grateful and hopefully we could have many more such future collaborations and programs uh, in the near future. So thank you all and thank you once again. Thank you sir. So we have come to the end of a five days international short term course on recent advance of 3D printing and its biomedical, biomedical engineering application. Hope all participants would have enjoyed the program. We are arranging the presentation from speakers and would be sharing soon with the, with the certificates. We thank all speakers, participants, organizers for their kind support in helping us organize this event. God bless you all. Thank you. Namaste. Tosia. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Professor ML Jain, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Thakur. Thank you, Professor Babu. Thank you so much. Professor, thank you, Dr. Professor Abadwani, sir. Thank you so much for being with us, sir. Thanks, really sir. Thank you, Dr. Thank, thank you, sir, so much, sir. Jay, you may please share the feedback link in the chat box as well as in the WhatsApp group for all participants. Yes, Mathan Kumar, we will be definitely sharing all PPTs. We are collecting all the PPTs. Some speakers have not given. So once we receive the PPT, we will share with all of you. The link is there for feedback. Kindly fill it. There are some questions also in this. So kindly answer the questions. Thanks to all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you.